All right, I'm very excited to bring in our guest here today to talk about everything. I said in the open that I, I've uh, really been looking forward to this. I've been trying to track this guy down for years to talk about everything that's going on in Survivor because he's seen it all. He's played with so many of these players. Here he is, the great four-time Survivor, Ozzy. Ozzy, how are you? I am awesome. I'm really, really excited to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm like you said, I'm, I'm a little bit hard to track down and I think it was at your event, yes. um, that, that, and I got to sit at the, uh, at the like round table or whatever, yeah, yeah. A couple other people. And I had a couple drinks in me, but I had a lot of fun. So Good. based off of that, I've always kind of like been a little wary of this type of thing, but you know, you are an authority on survivor and this season, I don't know if, if I'm uh, biased, because like you said, I've played with a lot of these players, but I think this is one of the best seasons of Survivor that I've ever seen or played in. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm really glad that we were able to work this out. And I've really been looking forward to talking to you because I feel like, and uh, you know, I, I, I tried to tell you this, uh, that it meant a lot to me that you came out to the 10 year anniversary show, but I feel like that people don't really know you particularly well. And I feel you don't do a lot of interviews that are like this. So uh, I'm really glad that we have this chance to talk about everything that's going on. Yeah, I'm excited as well. And you're exactly right. You know, just you, you probably know as well as I do that the interviews that you do, they're usually after you exit Survivor yeah. and then you get on the phone or you're in a room or whatever and you talk to reporters from, you know, all over the place and they kind of ask you the same questions over and over again. And, you know, you just, it, it's a little bit, you know, it's tough. So I, I feel like this is a really cool um, opportunity because you know you've played the game you've talked to probably every single survivor that has ever played you know this game so well and it's you know this this season's actually really kind of like rekindled or reignited my love for survivor and I've, I've always loved it but you know some seasons are like hit or miss this hmm. season i think is just phenomenal so i'm i'm all in what is it that you're seeing right now that is making you so excited about season 40 I just think that what I love so much about season 40 is, you know, it's been building upon the shoulders of all past seasons and you're mm -hmm. seeing, yeah, there's like old gameplay, there's new gameplay. This is like old school versus new school. You've got like people that have never played with twist. You've got people that have played with twist and just seeing how the adaptability and how people have to change their gameplay um, to, in order to get further in the game. So it's just kind of like the evolution, seeing the evolution of Survivor from, you know, first season with Hatch mm -hmm. all the way through and just seeing how, you know, how, for one, how they've been able to keep it fresh, I think yeah. is really exciting. Um, I think that some people kind of, myself included, look at, oh, it's been 40 seasons, how much longer can Survivor go before it starts to feel tired? and I think that this season's kind of proven that, you know, the producers and Jeff and everybody involved, they're really, they're really working hard to bring us like survivor, but constantly refresh so that you people are stay interested in, and even like people like you and I stay interested in wanting to see like, where is it going to go from here? So Ozzy, I don't really know this about you. Uh, how did you first get involved with Survivor when you ended up on your first season back in Cook Islands? Did, were you somewhere and they found you or was it something that you were interested in being a part of? Um, it's, a, it's kind of a weird story because when... I think it was 1999, right? That Fiverr Survivor first came 2000, on. 2000, yeah, 2000. It's going to be the 20-year anniversary next month. Right, so 2000. So I remember I had just graduated high school. Yeah. And Survivor came on. I was probably home from college, and I was at a friend's house, and I remember seeing, like, hearing about it. You know, back in the day when, you know, internet wasn't as what it is, and you had yeah. to, like, watch TV on the television, and there wasn't even TiVo. Like you, if you didn't watch Survivor, you missed it. Like you couldn't yeah. go back and watch episodes. So I remember not really knowing about it, hearing a little bit about it, and seeing like one of the final, one of the last um, challenges or one of the last episodes with Hatch. 
and just saying like, oh my God, this show is amazing. Like I want to be on it. You know, this is incredible. And then come to realize that you have to be 21 to be on yeah. it. So it just kind of like, I was like, ah, well, screw that. I'm never, you know, I'm, you know, maybe in three years or whatever, I'll be able to try out. And I just kind of forgot about it. And I moved to, I went to film school in Santa Barbara and I moved to Los Angeles. And within six months of being in Los Angeles, I had a roommate at the time that's very similar to me, Mexican surfer, skateboarder. Like we had this, like, you know, we kind of like, cousins we used to tell each other tell our friends we were cousins um he got approached by erica shea yeah and this was the season 13 where they were doing the split everybody up by races right so they were they were specifically you know i know the, the casting process i'm sure is convoluted and depending on what how they're going to do it they're looking for certain types of people you know yeah you know, they want to have like a, a, a broad range of characters this season in particular, they really wanted specific types of people. So they were going out looking for, you know, African-American, white, Asian, or Latino backgrounds. So they needed somebody who was like me, like a, you know, young Latino that kind of was like anti-stereotypical. And so Erica Shea, my, my roommate, he was, uh, he decided not to do it. He mm -hmm an actor type of guy and didn't want to so i just got super lucky he was like yo i met this casting agent at dinner do you want to be on survivor and i was like what? are you <laughs> yeah. kidding me it yeah. was a full-on fell in my lap one day because he decided to go out to dinner and erica shea picked him out of the crowd and and, and you know asked him about it the only thing was, is, you know, I had to make a video within, it was like 12 hours because they were right at the deadline. They had to like make decisions and fly people out for interviews. So I just like shot in the dark. I put together a video. I sent it in, you know, I got a call. I got the go and I went, you know, to the interviews. And then it was literally within, within a month flying out to the Cook Islands to go be on my first season of Survivor. So it was it was really just dumb luck. It was dumb luck. So I've tried to do some uh, research this afternoon, and I've gone back, and I'm, uh, there's some great Best of Ozzy stuff on YouTube, and I'm, I was uh, <laughs> watching you know, some uh, different things from your seasons. And you know, I was uh, just kind of struck by, you know, from like, uh, everybody knows about the, the challenges, but I feel like that you have an interesting take on the game where that for you... I feel like that there's some people that uh, really are able to separate, hey, it's a game, it's a game move. And I feel like that you look at uh, like betrayals in the game as more than just a move that you made to get over on somebody. Uh, is, is that a fair assessment to say? Yeah, I think that, that that's a very fair assessment. I think that my, my naivete... <laughs> has shown itself, especially as I've gotten older and I've sort of seen the way that the game has progressed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I got so close on my first season, um, sort of playing in a way that was not duplicitous, that was mm -hmm. straight up, that, and I got to within one vote. You know, I almost, in my opinion, if I had done a couple things differently, I could have played a, basically a perfect game of Survivor. Mm -hmm. where you can go to the end with a group of people, not screw anybody over, and really show that that's how you can play and win a game of Survivor. Now, the chances of being able to do that are so incredibly slim. The chances of winning Survivor are, are, are small, but the chances of being able to play a game like that where you, you're not screwing anybody over and you're honest to, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, to whatever extent you can, you know, I think that that was me being naive because of the way that my first season un, un, unrolled. Yeah. And then I went into other seasons sort of thinking that, okay, I can kind of play the same way and I'm going to try and do what I can. So that was my, I think my, my sort of fallback strategy was to just try and, you know, win at challenges and be straight up and honest with people. And, you know, I think that, that at the end of the day, you know, you've got to be able to adapt. And if you can't, if you're stuck in any one mindset or mind, uh, 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 yeah, if you're stuck in any, any mind mindset, you know, you're not adaptable and you, you're going to get broken by the game. 
And I think that happened to me a couple times, you know, I, I mm-hmm. trusted, you know, I went from being like, I'm going to be an honest person and trust people. And then, you know, got screwed over by, you know, lots of people. Um, and yeah. then trying to play uh, sort of, you know, the other way and not being very good at it is sort of like led to my downfall as well. So, you know, I still think that there's a way to, to, to do, to play survivor where you're not just lying to every single person. I haven't really found that, that, that strategy to work yeah. for me yet, but you know, who knows, maybe I'll be able to go back and try again. And so in uh, one of the videos I was watching, they were showing you from the final tribal council in, uh, in Micronesia. And you were saying that you were really betrayed by poverty because that it felt like to you that when she went, she went behind your back, that it was like she was saying to you that the, the friendship that you had with her, it's just, it, it's, oh, so you're saying to me that you're not worth this amount of money, that the, the, the bond that we have together. And I just thought that that was an interesting way of phrasing that because I hadn't really heard it uh, that way. And, and I wanted to just uh, bring that up in the context of that we see a lot of uh, relationships that are strained right now in the game, like Tony and Sarah, where coming into this episode, that Tony went behind Sarah's back and Sarah had to uh, really, you know, come come back with Tony and sort of, you know, decide, you know, how was she going to handle that moving forward? And, uh, that was a major betrayal that, uh, that Tony had, uh, done to her where he knocked Sophie out of the game who was working with Sarah and they have this real world relationship and she had to choose to get over it in that moment, but said, Hey, if I go out of the game, that this is over, I'm never talking to you again. And, uh, Tony seemed a little shocked by that. Yeah, and I think that Sarah is smart enough to know that she has emotions, and mm-hmm. she, you know, I'm sure she got incredibly upset because, yeah, Sophie was a big source of um, of safety in the game. Having somebody that you feel like you can work with and that 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 you know that you can trust and whatnot, you know, besides the like the relationship that Sarah and Tony have. By Sarah having Sophie, it's an extra added um, uh, safety net. So I think Sarah is also smart enough to know that she probably doesn't completely mean what she says, but it's a way to keep Tony in line. It's a way to keep Tony from maybe going completely off the deep end and totally uh, um, you know, throwing away any of the trust that, mm-hmm. that they've built up. Because look, if they've been friends with each other for you know, however many years, and that's a really important part of, you know, that's a really important relationship. If Sarah is just like, hey, Tony, whatever you want to do, you know, he's going to walk all over her. There's mm-hmm. got to be some like ramifications. There's got to be some sort of blowback for Tony just committing, doing whatever he wants to do. And if Tony's willing to throw, really willing to throw away the relationship that he has with Sarah for $2 million, I don't think many people can blame him. Mm-hmm. I certainly can't at this point. Yeah. Let's be honest. We're all going to come around at the end of the day and say, you know what? To win $2 million, would I lie to my friend? Yeah, we probably would. If, if it's in the context of a game, this is part of part and parcel of Survivor. It doesn't say anywhere in the rules that you can't lie to people. You know, that's just, that's just you, you, know what you're getting, you know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Sorry, that was me. You know what you're getting yourself into. So I think that Sarah has to do what she can to kind of like, hold a stick up to Tony and say, look, Tony, if you do this kind of thing, like we're not going to be friends ever inside of the game, outside of the game, whether she means it or not, probably not. But what else is she going to do? She's got to say something, you know? You know, as somebody who's, you know, played this game uh, over like a long period of time, how old were you the, the first time that you played? Man, I think I was 24. 24. And then uh, the last time you went, you were what, 35? I was 36. 36. 36. Yeah. Do you feel like that that type of betrayal, do you think, is that easier for a person who's younger or a person who's had more life experience? <laughs> um, I don't necessarily think it matters if you're young or old. I think it just matters your, your, your viewpoint of how to play a survivor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't, I think that some people completely just know that it's a game. And as soon as they're 
you know, Jeff reads out their name and they're, they have to bring their torch up. They're just kind of like, all right, great job guys. And they're a good sport about it. Mm -hmm. I think I've, you know, for me personally, I've always, I've always taken my relationships in survivor personally. Yeah. Um, I haven't done a very good job separating. Um, and that's, I think one of my weakest points of when I, when I played survivor is not, you know, not realizing that, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a game. So we have to, you know, you're going to play hard and you're going to play rough, but you know, you got to just separate it at, at when it's all said and done. Yeah. And look, I think that that's part of the beauty of the game is that there are people who look at it. Oh, this is, you know, just a game. And like Richard Hatch from that very first season was one of like, uh, like, oh, if I'm playing Monopoly and I and I knock you out of the game, it's, you know, I'm not I didn't mean anything by it. It's just that's what happens in the game. Uh, whereas there are other people like yourself who come at it from a completely different viewpoint and uh, it doesn't make one more valid than the other. Yeah, exactly. At the end of the day, it just is about art. Is your strategy going to get you to the place that you want it to? Mm -hmm. And is it going to make, is it going to, is it going to let you win the game? So, you know, you can play from a, a, a spot of being completely duplicitous, lying to every single person. Are you going to win the game? Maybe, maybe not. Just mm -hmm. depends on how you tell those lies. It depends on who you tell those lies to. Depends on a lot of different factors. So I do still think that there is room in Survivor for playing, you know, a little more honorably yeah. for, whatever, for whatever that means. Um, I don't think it's the right strategy for a lot of people. I think it's a really difficult strategy and I think, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anybody. You mm -hmm. know, I think that you're setting yourself up for, you know, pain and suffering. So um, I think that, you know, just speaking to like, when to tell the truth and when not to tell the truth in Survivor, I think that there's always, there's always room for the truth. And I think that, you know, the final tribal council is one place where the, you should always be telling the truth. Um, I think I've seen in my four seasons, I've seen at least two circumstances where, you know, somebody lost the game because they decided to like continue lying and coach. I think yeah. that, that was a great example um, specifically in my final tribal council question, um, I gave him a softball and I said, coach, look, if you continue lying, people aren't going to vote for you. Just, just admit that you lied to everybody, that you used Christianity or used your faith yeah. as a bargaining chip. And if you do that, you've got a bunch of people here that are willing to vote for you. But if you continue the lie, then, you know, you don't have it. You don't have, and he continued the lie and he didn't win. Sophie won. And Sophie played a pretty good game, but I think that it was coach's game to lose. That's why Sophie won that game. Okay, I think but I, done, go ahead. Yeah, I'm dying to know who the, uh, the coach was the easy one. I'm dying to know who the other one is. Um, fans versus favorites, Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, unless Amanda is lying to me, Mm -hmm. Something that I, I talked about this in a, a Zoom call with uh, for Eliza's thing. The other okay, night. last night, yeah. Last night, yeah. The, the, the fundraiser for Eliza for Manhattan DA, sure. Exactly, which everybody should support her because she's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something that I found out, and I didn't find out until many years later. Of course, Amanda and I had a showmance, and I made a big, like, sort of, statement in final tribal saying I was like falling in love with her and all these things. Um, a few years later, you know, Amanda's and I's relationship, it didn't go anywhere after the game. Right. You know, we ended up breaking up and whatnot. Um, but a few years after that, she confessed to me that she, it was actually her plan. It was her mastermind plan to vote me out that she got Parvati and Sari on board and mm -hmm. that it was her idea to vote me out. Now, I don't know if people would have changed their vote, but I think that if she was, had been honest about that yeah. in final tribal council and said, look, babe, I understand you have feelings for me, but you know what? This was a game and it was my plan to vote you out. I think that that would have been a huge, a huge sort of um, enlightenment uh, a huge moment of enlightenment for a lot of the jury. And they maybe would have said, Hey, Amanda's actually a better game player than people realize. Yeah. Now, she also has, she also has a problem with uh, public speaking. So yeah. She, yeah. She kind of messed up just because of that. So, right. 
Now, do you uh, 100% believe that? Because I feel like that that is like a major piece of survivor history that would be changed if that was the case. I do believe it. I think that it was Amanda's idea and I think Parvati ran with it. Mm -hmm. I think Parvati said, hey, I'll be the bad guy. I'll be the one so that you can save face with with Ozzy. Mm -hmm. I I do believe that. And I think that, you know, I've never asked... I, I always, whenever I see Parvati, I forget to ask her. Yeah. But we should ask her because that okay. would be really, that If would be I really get the chance to talk to Parvati or Sari anytime soon, I will uh, see if they have uh, their take on it. Maybe they could do like a whole oral history of, uh, of that. Um, well, let's actually, uh, since we're on you uh, getting voted out in Survivor Micronesia, that I was uh, amazed that, when I'm sure that this was not fun for you to see the challenge that came back because that was the challenge that ultimately you took the donuts and had got the uh, step down from the challenge to set up them being able to vote you out the same exact challenge that they did last night. Yeah, that challenge sucks. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is the worst challenge ever. Um, you know, it seems like such an easy thing just doing that. Yeah. But it's like, it, it's, it's so much more difficult, but they, well, they even, made it much more difficult. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. They did. I mean, I Parvati won that challenge and they played, I think they went for over an hour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was feeling, I was feeling really bad for Kim. Yeah. Soon, as soon as she saw the peanut butter and she dropped, you know, I was like, oh man, it's going to be her going home tonight, isn't it? You know? Yeah. It's just one yeah. of those things. It's like, it's crazy how your mind in that moment, you know, it's been a month. You have a yeah. Meeting, how your mind tricks you into thinking like, oh, you're going to be safe. Just like you need more energy. Like just drop. You're going to be fine. Turns out, you know, that was probably a million dollar mistake for her. Yeah. Or two million dollars. Two million dollars. But, but Ozzy, I think they've made the challenge so hard that it, it, to me it was like uh, Kim and Michelle like were about to give out and were holding on like a couple more seconds just to get the food. Do you uh, do you feel like that maybe because well because it's so much harder than Denise could have uh, you know also collapsed in a, any second uh, and so it's the same thing because I feel like that when you guys went through it uh, it's like you could have been up there for three more hours so it's like it really is a temptation. Yeah, but I think that that's exactly why you don't, you should never get tempted because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it's there for. It's like, yeah, you get a really small, like it's an instant gratification, but the long term gain is just so much better. So, you know, I think that it was, it was a, it was a shame on Nick's part. It was a shame on, on Michelle and Kim's part. And yeah, maybe they were about to fall off. So like might as well get a little bit of peanut butter, but mm -hmm. you know, I don't believe that. I think that they could have, you know, they really could have like put in some more time and you know, that's what happens. You, you get, you get a, you get an opportunity like that. Denise, Denise and Tony, they had a great opportunity and you know, they capitalized. I'm so surprised. I mean, Tony doesn't, he isn't, the kind of like I wouldn't consider him to be very good at balancing. I wouldn't consider yeah. him to be, he's a strong guy, but I wouldn't necessarily consider him to be that good at these individual immunity challenges. And yet, there you go, three three back to back wins. So who knows? Maybe Tony's uh, running away with it. We'll see. Yeah, what it's gotten into Tony where he's not somebody who's won a lot of immunity challenges in the past, but now here he is with uh, three in a row. Can you get hot, Ozzy? Like, can you sort of like uh, once you win one, do you sort of like, is it a confidence thing? I think that confidence has a lot to do with it. Um, the individual immunity challenges, yeah, there's you sometimes have momentum going into them. And sometimes when you have that momentum, even if there's a, something happening mentally to the, your other competitors, if they just think that you're going to win, you know, sometimes that might be the difference between you winning or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I, an example I'll have for you right now is um, when I was on Redemption Island um, playing against Brandon Hance. Yes. Um, the fucking worst, maybe the worst survivor challenge, if not the second worst, hanging on that pole. Yeah. Brandon was so close to beating me. Like he was so close to beating me, but I think that there was something in his mind that told him like, 
Ozzy's not going to give up. So he, he was battling his own mind. He didn't, he wasn't necessarily battling me. He was battling his own mind. And I think his own mind beat him because I like literally after he fell, like my legs were completely numb. It was only by the grace of God that I was still up there. So, yeah. you know, it's just a, it's just a small example of, you know, your mental state has a lot to do with how far you can go in this game. So, yeah. Now, why do you say that that is the worst challenge hanging on to the pole now? Cause you have, you have won it twice. Is it, is it the actual pain from the challenge or does it have to do with game changers? Oh, it has to do with game changers. It's yes. like, for me, it's like, I thought I was so good and I was like, oh, there's no way. And of course, maybe one of the only people that could have beaten me in all of the survivor players was Ty. I mean, yeah. Ty was like so incredibly strong and just, you know, he had it. Yeah, so. well, let me just set uh, this up why I wanted to talk about this because in Survivor Game Changers, ultimately when they come to blindside you, it seems like that maybe that people were not necessarily thinking about you. It's you and Ty up on those uh, beams for what, an hour and a half or something like that? Something like, like that. Uh, a long time, and it's like everybody's just standing there watching. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how you have done this, won this challenge twice before, and then that's where it seems like that from in the episode that Debbie and people start talking about, oh, we got to get out Ozzy now because of how well he's doing in the, in the challenge, and then that started to really get the ball rolling to, to get you out. And... I was thinking about this because as uh, I was, I, you know, uh, was watching that clip also, and I saw Tyson, who, like yourself, has been uh, somebody who's done great at this challenge before. Mm -hmm. And I haven't asked him about this because I don't want to like uh, find, you know, while well, the show is still going on, I, I, I don't like to know too much about what's going on. But I wonder, I, I said this uh, at, at the time, do you think that Tyson might have thrown the challenge where somebody who's won this challenge before, now it was rainy also out there, and I don't know how that much uh, changes things up, and time has gone by since he played in his first season and won that challenge. Do, like, do you think that maybe people have said, hey, I'm not going to go out and like uh, show how long I can stay up there and let people sit there and watch me compete in this challenge? Yeah, but was that the challenge that he got voted out? He didn't get voted out that one. He, I think it was, uh, it, it, but it was his first one where he came back after being right. back from the edge. Right, right. You know, I think for people like Tyson or myself, not playing to your to your to the fullest of your abilities in a challenge like especially like that where you have the potential to win, it could be a mistake as well. It's just mm -hmm. so hard to know. Um, I, you know. In hindsight, looking back, if I had fallen off the 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 pole like immediately and just yeah. sort of like tried to play more undercover and been a little smarter about my relationships, maybe I could have made it a little further, at least gotten to the next boat. I don't know. I think that my time was pretty much up as soon as as soon as as soon as I was going to lose a challenge, uh, in, an individual immunity challenge, and game changers. I think that like I was pretty much done. Mm -hmm. My biggest problem in that season was, you know, I didn't do enough scrambling after that. After that, we came back from that challenge. You know, I listened to my alliance. I thought we were good, and I didn't. I didn't do enough scrambling. I didn't find an immunity idol. I didn't have any advantages. But I didn't really try to like. I didn't really. I just didn't think I was going home until you know we were sitting at tribal. And I started getting that feeling and I was like, well, at this point, I just knew I was, I was done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that, I think you should always try your hardest um, in the challenges. I think that there might be opportunities in some of these individual challenges if you have like a couple advantages in your pocket or you have like a strong alliance or you have an ability to like, you know, make it further without, in, without having individual immunity, you might want to do it. But it's the most powerful thing in the game. So mm -hmm. if you can get it, I think you should get it. And it's, you know, it's given Tony a really, a really strong advantage. You know, I think we've seen, you know, he's been kind of like skirting on the chopping block, but no one can touch him now. And he's like driving the game. Tony's driving the game because he's has, he's got, he knows that Ben's got an idol. He's got his own idol. He's got individual 
immunity. Yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't look like there's any. It doesn't look like there's any stopping him, but it also looks really dangerous to be in his position because he's he's just like unfolded this giant target. And everybody knows like how are you going to beat Tony? You go to the end. If anyone goes to the end with Tony, he's going to win. Like mm-hmm. it, 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 I, you have to assume that they all think that. You know, I don't think that there's anyone. Maybe somebody like Natalie coming back from uh, from from the edge. Maybe Natalie coming back from the edge, being like the first out, she might be, and she's a good talker. She might mm. be able to dissuade people. She might be able to get some votes, but I just don't see it. I think that, you know, Nick and um, Nick and Sarah, and I mean, pretty much everybody, everybody that Tony should be public enemy number one at this point. Yeah. And, you know, who knows what they're feeling like being in the game maybe they're not able to see it. Maybe they think their games, maybe Ben thinks his game is like just as good as Tony's. Yeah. Maybe Sarah thinks her game is just as good as Tony's, but like from, from our standpoint, from a player or even from the like people just watching looks like yeah. Tony is playing the best game of anybody so far. Yeah. I think they know. I mean that there was a lot of people on board for, Hey, let's vote out Tony and things then definitely had to change once he won the immunity necklace in the challenge. So I, I think that people were definitely on board with, okay, Tony's time is up. But what they didn't know, or so many of them didn't know, was that he also has an idol on top of that. So they could have tried to vote him out and it would have been the same uh, thing where he would have been able to play his idol. I, I want to uh, stick with Tyson here for a second yeah. because I- I'm wondering if you think that Tyson might be able to do what you did in uh, Survivor South Pacific where could he potentially return from the edge of extinction again and come back two times in the same game like you did once upon a time? For sure. I think that Boston Rob, Tyson, maybe Natalie. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I think Natalie's really strong and really good, but I think there's something about, you know, Tyson has proven his ability to do it. He's Mm -hmm. got, he's got, He's got great balance. He's got the pressure under under. He's got poise under pressure. Um, he's sort of my number one out of all the contenders that are on uh, edge that may go to edge. I think Tyson is my favorite to come back in the game. Yeah, and I do think that Tyson, if he's able to come back in the game for a second time, depending on how he plays, I think that maybe he could stand up to Tony. Maybe, but. I, I still, it'd be hard for me to vote against. It, it'd be hard for me to vote against, uh, not vote for Tony in that situation. I don't know who. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but Tyson's also. I mean, he's he's incredibly funny and warm. Yeah. He has a gift of gab. I mean, there's it's you never know when it comes to a final tribal. If you had Tony and and say you had Tony and Tyson. And if we're doing a final three, maybe Tony Tyson and someone like Nick, mm-hmm. I think it's just kind of like not really, he's right. not really made any big moves. He's just kind of like there. Right. So mm-hmm. it would be, I think it would be against Tony and Tyson. Yeah. It would be really interesting. I, I, I think I'd, I'd like to see that, but I, I would have a hard time still because Tony's just, he's been out playing people. Yeah. In um, South Pacific, uh, that you know, that people say that you would have uh, won if you would have gotten to the end uh, because you, there were more people from uh, Sabai that were on the jury, and uh, you would have you would have gotten all those votes. Did you give yourself ever a, a time to think about what you would have said? at the final tribal council where people uh, came in saying like, Ozzy, why should we vote for you? You got voted out twice in this game as opposed to these people who didn't get voted out in this game. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> I had my whole speech ready to go. I was like, I was like, all right, all we got to do is win this one challenge. That's it. Yeah. And that fucked me. I mean, I was so, I mind fucked myself. I got so in my head, like, I was like, oh, shit, you can win the game. Like, you did it. You got to the point you wanted to get. You, you like, you did it. All you got to do is this simple challenge. You're good at this. You can do it. And it's just like my mind went completely blank. Like, I just couldn't, I couldn't, like, even, like, make sense of anything. Um, so, yeah, I thought about, I thought about exactly what I was going to say. And, you know, I think that I, 
I had a really strong track record. I yeah. got myself voted out the first time to help my tribe to get yeah. back in the game. So that in and of itself- You like, told them vote, vote you out so you can go. It was your idea. Yeah, not only that, but I gave Cochran my, my, my idol. Yeah. So, you know, I think that I had built up a really strong resume. I think that I was like ready to go. And I know that losing that challenge was, you know, it was heartbreaking to me because I, I it was, for me, that challenge was the game. I knew if I, I knew if I won, I was going to win. And I knew if I lost, I was out. So, you know, at the end of the day, it just was too much pressure for me. I put so much pressure on myself. It was like the whole history of me playing however hundred days or whatever it yeah. was at that point. It just all kind of like crushed me. And, you know, I just didn't have the mental poise to make it. It's like what you were talking about with Brandon Hance. Yeah, it's exactly it. You know, it's exactly it. Being able to remove your own worst enemy, which is your mind. Yeah. You know, being able to separate your mind from what you need to do to, to make it in the game. You know, I think it's a lesson for a lot of people. You know, I, people always ask me what it takes to be a sole survivor or what it takes to do well in Survivor. And I think a huge part of that is knowing that your mind is your own worst enemy. Yeah. Your, your emotions in your mind. And if you, can be, if you can separate those, if you can feel, you know, if someone is being an asshole or being rude or being whatever, if you can separate your emotions and you can separate your, like, your, what you want to just say in that moment and think about it and just come at it with a little more clinical sort of, I want to say, like, a Buddhist mm -hmm. mentality, um, you've got a huge advantage. But the problem is, is most of us, we don't operate that way. We, yeah. we, we do, we live, you know, we think our thoughts are who we are. We think our emotions are who we are. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just something that one of my biggest takeaways from this game is just how to work on being more present moment, mm -hmm. being more um, aware of those things and, and trying to just give yourself an opportunity to sort of see the emotions come up and go away. Was that something that you tried to work on before you went back for Game Changers? It was something I tried to work on. I, tr I really tried to work on just, you know, being more present, being more in the moment with people. I don't think I did a very good job on Game Changers. I kind of got into like, you know, I trust the people I shouldn't have and I didn't trust people I should have. And, you know, I don't, I don't really know if I'm that good at reading people. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that I like listen to my gut when I should. I think that I, I you know, I, I think I'm still really bad at my listening to my emotions and not my gut. I don't know. It's hard to separate. What's the difference between listening to your emotions and, and your gut? Well, because I think your emotions maybe are a little more superfluous and superficial. I think your gut is just kind of like this other feeling, you know, like I my gut told me in fans versus favorites that I should take my hidden immunity idol. Yeah. But, but my heart and my brain were telling me like, no, Amanda and, and Parvati, like we're locked in. We're yeah. solid. Like, I don't even want people looking through my bag. I'm going to leave the idol here. And sure enough, like my gut told me, but I didn't listen to it. You know, I was listening to some other like voices in my head. If you had it, would you have played it? I would have. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I started getting that queasy feeling and I was like, oh man, this is, this is not good. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's funny because I don't think Jeff does this on purpose and I don't think that, you know, I don't think he knows who people are voting for, but I think that he's agile enough that he senses how people are acting and reacting that he, at, he asks enough questions and he asks in a way and you can start to discern like how people are going to vote, even though you try to say, Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to blindside somebody, you're going to say things as politically as possible. You still got to start getting that sense of dread. Mm -hmm. so. When you say that uh, if you can try to, you know, uh, work on that, you know, listening to your gut and, and being more mindful of that, uh, what is the way that you can uh, actually improve that skill set? God, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, cause I could use it Ozzy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's like, that's like a $2 million question at this point. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you develop that. I think that, you know, your intuition is something that 
that you can work on, but I, God knows how to do that. I don't mm. know. That's something that, you know, maybe I need to develop a, a an exercise for that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And I could, I could use that for sure. Yeah. When we were talking about uh, South Pacific and how close you were, that uh, you know, I, I always thought that uh, Cook Islands was probably the one that you look back at and say, okay, that's the one that I should have had. Do you feel like that South Pacific was actually that one, that that was really the, the season that was yours for the taking more so? For sure, 100%. South Pacific was my game to lose. Um, I knew what I had to do, and I just couldn't, I couldn't execute. Yeah, And I think that if my younger self, if my self from, you know, Cook Islands was playing that game, hands it would have been over. But I think that the, like I said, all of those experiences leading up to that, all of the like 38 days that I played, all of the like duels that I had to win, yeah. everything just kind of like, it just, I had a short circuit in my mind, you know, and that was definitely like, that was the, if I could have won that game, that would have also been like my sort of perfect game. Yeah. I didn't have to lie to anybody. I didn't have to like backstab anybody. I tried to, I tried to use my idol. I tried everything in my, in my wheelhouse to make it further in the game. And I just got so close. I got so close to it. So, yeah. Um, can you talk about uh, the Edge of Extinction and how you feel about uh, what they've done with the Edge of Extinction? Because obviously it's a, it's a polarizing twist. Uh, Redemption Island was polarizing, but I feel like that the Edge of Extinction even more polarizing with a lot of the fans. Yeah, I can understand how, you know, being having an advantage of being able to basically stay in the game till the very end and potentially come back and win. Yeah. I hate to say it, but watching, um, what was the last one that, that was also called Edge of Extinction? So Edge of Extinction, yeah, was season 38, and then there was one in the right. middle that right. we don't talk about as much. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I really like Rick Devins. Mm -hmm. I was really rooting for him to kind of win, and, you know, having somebody come back from the edge and win the whole game when they hadn't really been in the game yeah, left a bittersweet taste in my mouth because I was like, oh man, I want to, I want to do that. Like, that's how I would do it. But yeah, you know, I can understand from a fan's point of view, it's like, you know, it's almost like they took like a, I won't want to say easy way out, but they just sort of like took this, like, you know, kind of like a shortcut in a way. Um, so I don't know. I do. What was the like shortcut? Well, to be able to go to uh, Edge and yeah. then win yourself back into the game and then to be Got able it. to convince the jury. Again, like, you know, if you're up against people that can't convince a jury, if, if you've been in the game this whole time and you never got sent to Edge, you didn't get voted out, and then someone comes back from Edge and they're able to convince the jury, mm -hmm. you know, I do feel like you should win because that's like, you know, that's just part of the game. But I think it's also different because – when you're talking about players that you've never met before and yeah. the of extinction, it doesn't feel as good to me as this season where we have people that we know and love. They're coming back to play. Right. And I think Jeff talked about this in the beginning, like why they're doing edge of extinction for season 40. And you know, what goes into getting on survivor, it takes so much time and energy, your flights and you're getting out there and then the gate, you know, it's months and months of prep work. You finally get there. And if you're mm -hmm. first out, it's like a shame because we have 20 amazing characters here. I want to see like what happens with them in and outside of either in the game or on edge of extinction, because you know, edge of extinction, this, at least with the fire tokens and all of the event, like at least they're still playing and they're still contributing to the game and they're still creating this interesting sort of back and forth. So I would be happy if somebody came back from Edge to and won the game, somebody that's not currently playing right now. Um, mm -hmm. But it's only because I think that, you know, having all of these winners, I think it's great to see their whole entire arc. And, you know, having to, like Natalie, having to spend, you know, 37 days if she's able to come back, if she spent 37 yeah. days on Edge, you know, it's also, that's commendable. You know, that's something that I think needs to, should be rewarded. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. 
How different is it for in Redemption Island, or sorry, in, in uh, South Pacific when you were on Redemption Island that uh, you talked about how that your strategy was people were going to come in, you were going to catch them a fish, you were going to give them like a, a, like a nice send off, and then you were going to beat them in the challenge and send them to the jury. Uh, and but you had like an opportunity for like a one on one time with people yeah. where hey they're upset I just got voted out and you could be like uh, you know talk them through it and yeah. then send them to the jury whereas opposed to the people that are on the edge of extinction they're all together as one group and then you know have the opportunity to then uh, you know uh, vote for somebody who was part of that group uh, at the end of the game uh, do you see any differences between those two things? Oh man. Yeah. And when you put it like that, it kind of, you almost have an advantage being on edge. Yeah. You can make it, if, if you're one of the people that, that isn't currently uh, in the game, you know, and you, you get sent to edge and then you make it right back in, you're almost at a disadvantage because everybody that's sitting, that's together on edge, they're coalescing, they're mm -hmm. able to hang out. There's like, probably less gameplay. I mean, who knows what they're actually talking about, but I'm, I'm sure that there's like little mini alliances on yeah. edge, like people, you know, someone like Rob, I'm sure, or Tyson is, you know, making sure that he's trying to get people on his side, get votes lined up. Mm -hmm. If in the event you can get back in, then all of a sudden you've got, you know, this like 15 people that you've been hanging out with for the last, you know, however yeah. long they're maybe more on your side than somebody who is still in the game. I don't know, man. It's a, it's super really interesting because I did have an advantage. I, I, and I use that completely to my advantage. Every single person that came from, um, from the game got voted out and came to redemption. You know, we had a, like a great time pretty much. I think every single one of them I had food for, so they had something to eat and I was like, let's good sportsmen best yeah. of luck to you, you know, whatever I could do, whatever I could say to try and get their vote after it was all said and done, I did. And that was my, that was my strategy. So I would, I would assume that that's exactly what's going on in the game right now, that everybody is still playing hard. The people on edge are seeing it like, all right, you know, you still have a really strong shot. That's one of the reasons also that I think that this is such an interesting season is there are so many factors involved. You've got you've got the fire tokens, which we still don't know what what kind of advantage that's going to get somebody. If is that going to is that going to win somebody the game? The fact that they've you know accumulated all these tokens, like maybe somebody from Edge is going to build up this like arsenal of of fire tokens that they're then going to be able to buy a really amazing advantage that they're then going to and know, an idol win somebody the game and yeah. an idol, you know yeah. So I'm I'm just. I love all the moving parts. I think that Survivor has sort of like hit a new stride. I, I hope that they continue up with these, you know, crazy twists. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's really going to be interesting to see what happens. And uh, I don't know. I don't know who I'm, I still, I, I had people I was rooting for and I just, I don't know who to root for anymore. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people that you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I thought that Sophie had a great shot. Um, I thought that Parvati had a great shot. Um, at this point, it does look like Tony has like a, a lead on everybody. Yeah. But he's also put himself into such a such a predicament. You know, he's got a huge target. Everybody should be going after him. Um, but yeah, I think somebody like Rob or or Tyson, they've very, I mean, you cannot discount them because I think that they could very easily come back into the game and win. I would love to see some sort of incredible endurance challenge for the final challenge mm -hmm. for to get back into the game. Yeah, yeah. I think that something that where they're not having to like, you don't have to be the fastest, you don't have to be the strongest, you just have to want it the most. I would mm -hmm. love to see a challenge like that where, you know, almost something like the... Um, the challenge with uh, where you put your hand on a on the post, yeah, and just, yeah, and that you just stay there as long as you can. I'd yeah. love to see another like endurance, like twenty four hour challenge. I think that would be incredible. That would be great. 
it, it, but you know, it's going to be an obstacle course. It's going to be like the same thing that, that they always do on these because they have to build in advantages and stuff like that. So it's yeah. probably going to be more of the same. It really is. And you're right. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited for this. It, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool to have this kind of like this kind of excitement for survivor again. Mm -hmm. So, how do you feel about the final four fire making challenge uh, that they started that the season after the last time you played in season 35? Do you like that as being a uh, part of the game? Uh, I, I suspect you probably would have liked it in South Pacific. Yeah, I would have loved that. In South yeah. Pacific. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, I was trying to convince coach to go to tie to go yeah. to the fire making challenge. I was trying to do whatever I could to get a fire making challenge to happen. I do love that. Um, I think a lot of people, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what fans think. Um, I, I like it because I think that, you know, the one skill that you should come out of survivor with is yeah. being able to make a fire, you know? And I think that's also an, another, you know, I look back and cringe at myself, my 24 year old self when we put Sandra, uh, Sandra and Becky to a fire making yes, yes. and I was just so, I was so obviously distraught at how they couldn't make a fire for like, it took them like an hour or more. Mm -hmm. to yeah. fire, and I was just blown away by that. And I let my emotions sort of get the better of me. And I like made, I think I chastised them both and made them feel bad about themselves for not learning how to do it. And that was such a stupid young rookie move of myself, but yeah. also just highlights the fact that, you know, if you don't know how to make a challenge on day 38, you probably shouldn't win the game. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to ask you a little bit about um, Jeremy and Ben in this episode where they uh, there was definitely a disagreement uh, that it seemed like that um, there was just like uh, bad blood between them that had been just like festering for a while to the point where they're not talking to one another. Have, have you uh, been so upset with anybody in the course of playing Survivor that you're in that, that same headspace that Ben is in where he doesn't even want to talk to Jeremy? I've been in that headspace, but only after being voted out. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's unusual. It's unusual that people aren't talking to each other like that on the beach. Yeah, I mean, it, it happened, it's happened to me a few times where I haven't been included on, in on a vote. Mm -hmm. um, the blind side of, God, it was on, it was on uh, fans versus favorites. It was uh, early in the game. And Jim, Jim decided to blind, he decided to take out maybe Elise or someone. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. And it yeah. like, was disconcerting. It was, it was, it, it, it bummed me out. But at the end of the day, I came back and I was like, look, all right, you guys obviously are in charge. Mm -hmm. You know what? Whoever wants to play with me, I'm down. But I didn't get, it wasn't so emotional that I would say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to this person. I think that Ben's making a big mistake, honestly. I think Ben, Ben needs, Ben should be looking at Tony and Sarah and considering that they're playing a better game than him, mm -hmm. or they're at least making more strategic moves, more obvious strategic moves to everybody else. And he should look at that and say, okay, you know, does he, does, does going up against Tony, is it going to be, or anyone else? Is that, is, is it better to, to, is it better to have Tony on my side? Be sitting next to Tony or is it better to sit next to Jeremy and I could make the argument that yeah I mean I, I know that Jeremy's an amazing guy he's a firefighter he's got a big family yeah. um, but I feel like I feel like Jeremy and Ben are playing a similar game so if I was Ben I'd be looking at Jeremy and I'd be trying to make an alliance with him I'd be trying to like let that let that let that water flow under the bridge and try to move on because Ben's not, he's not in a very good position being uh, aligned with Tony. He's not. Mm -hmm. So yeah. For Jeremy and Tony, it's an interesting relationship because that uh, Jeremy looks at Tony and saying like, hey, I, I w like working with Tony because at least Tony is a bigger target than I am. But 
Tony also looks at Jeremy the same way where he feels like, okay, I, everybody's trying to vote out Jeremy every week. I got to keep him in the game because he's my, he's my shield who I'm going to, he's going to like there for whatever reason, people are going Jeremy, 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 uh, mostly because Tony's immune. Uh, but that keeps people having the target off of, uh, from Tony. Uh, was, was there ever a person that uh, you played with that was a bigger target than you were? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that Game Changers is probably my biggest, my the easiest place for me to draw a comparison. Yeah, and I looked at Culpepper as being that guy for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought that he would be much more of a target. I think that you know, unfortunately, my um, my ideas about him were right and wrong like i i thought that okay if i can go to the end with cole pepper i think that he's competitive enough that he thinks that he can beat me mm -hmm. but i know that most likely the jury's not going to vote for him because he's brad cole pepper of nfl fame like mm -hmm. he doesn't need it he doesn't need it at all um so i think that he was probably for me he was probably that that player um or somebody like jt yeah or, or somebody like Malcolm or, you know, some of those other big physical threats. Those were the types of people that I was trying to like work with. Um, the game didn't go that way. I couldn't, yeah. I never played with Malcolm. I never played with JT. We were always again. I mean, we, we did have a, like a couple moments and then tribes got switched up, but like, those were my guys because I thought, okay, we all have huge targets. Let's be, let's be safe together and then let's get, get to the end and then we can battle it out. Battle Royale style, best man wins. So, you know, those were Tony's, Tony's strategy using Jeremy is a great strategy. It yeah. really is. I really was impressed with Tony also. I, I watched the episode again this morning and, you know, that Tony gets word that, okay, Kim is trying to get people to vote out Tony, but don't. But Nick says, don't worry about it. You're immune. Uh, they can't get you anyway, so it's nothing to worry about. Tony's not going to let it go. Once he hears Kim is working to get people against him, then he's like, okay, I got to figure out a way to still get Kim. And he goes to Jeremy. Uh, I, I'm sorry, he goes to Ben. And he's like, uh, Ben, Ben, l let me ask you, please, please, is there anything I can do to get you to vote with Jeremy? And because he knows, like, uh, he's having to, like, do damage control and try to, like, he's, he's try to, he needs to mediate between Ben and Jeremy to try to get them back on the same page to vote against Kim to get what he wants to have happen. So uh, I thought that uh, that's not something I, I would have thought would have been in Tony's skill set of having to play the mediator between two guys who are at odds with each other. Yeah, I thought that was a great move as well. And I really, I really liked how he, he's using a couple different people as sort of his like canaries, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, Nick being like a huge example. I mean, we could all see it. He just was not prepared for the question from Tony. Tony straight up asks him and Nick's like, what, what, uh, 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 uh. and it was obvious yeah, he yeah. was lying. He, he really like dug himself into a hole there. And he's kind of like given uh, Tony a little more, um, a little more ammunition because now Tony knows that Nick is not being honest with him. He knows now what's going on with the other people in the alliance, uh, in, in Kim's alliance. So I think that his move right there was really does show how far Tony has come in, in his arc of playing the game. I think he's, he's, he's somehow he's matured in his gameplay. Um, he was like playing like a wild man, um, yeah. game changers and it got him into trouble. I think he's, done just enough to like not get into trouble but he's had some really great moves and i think that's one of them and i think that that you know if if there's a defining moment in tony's career you know that could end up being one of the things that that really tips the scales for him yeah it was very impressive and he wouldn't let it go to the point where they got to tribal council and it seemed like that going into that tribal council, there were going to be five votes on Jeremy. I, I think that Ben and Nick 
were ready to write down Jeremy when they got to Tribal Council. And I really think that Tony uh, starting to whisper to Jeremy at Tribal Council ended up putting the wheels in motion for, for Nick and for Ben to ultimately flip and put their votes on to uh, Kim. Do you feel like it happened that way or do you think that that happened before they got to the Tribal Council? Oh man, well this whole like whispering thing at yeah. Tribal is like kind of driving me crazy. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I feel about the whispering. Um, and it really I, started in Game Changers at a Tribal Council that you weren't at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but, you know, like... If we could hear what they're saying, I think that would be one thing. I think yeah. just simply production giving us subtitles so we know the story. Yeah. That's flying and last night forth. it seemed like that they did do that. Yeah, yeah, it was way better last night because you kind of could t you could tell who was talking to who. I think it's great for the jury as well to see who's really pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to say, but I think what's telling is the fact that Jeremy had an advantage that he chose not to play. Yeah. I thought he was going to. Sarah was about to call Tony out to play an advantage, and she then says, okay, don't play. So they have a lot of trust. They've got a lot of trust in Tony. And again, Tony's driving this game. He Right now, he's in the driver's seat. He's the mob boss. Yeah. He's got all of the attention of everybody who's on the jury. They all know who's playing, who's driving this game. Everyone who I think is still in the game knows that Tony is, is pretty much the puppet master. So Tony's got a, I mean, this game has just, it's sort of, he's got it right where he wants it, but Tony has a lot of work to do, man. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of work to do. But let's consider, okay, how many people are left in the game? Seven. There's, there's seven people left. So he's got a uh, hidden immunity. So he's going to make it, maybe that hidden immunity only allows him to go to four maybe so if he wins one or two if he wins two more challenges if he wins one more challenge i mean he might just be sitting in the end and no one can do a damn thing about it so. yeah so there's going to be i think four more votes because there's a vote at seven six five and then somebody will come back from the edge and then there'll be another five and then they do fire making at four so there's four more tribal councils he's going to have the immune the um uh, his idol still for one of them so yeah. Uh, that's still three shots that they could get in on Tony if he doesn't win any more immunities or find any more idols. Yeah, which I I think Tony's pretty damn good at finding idols. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that there's going to be some other advantages that happen. Who knows how many... He probably doesn't have any fire tokens at this point because he had to... He has to keep, another, keep giving them back, yeah. That was another great move, by the way. Which one? He saved his ass there. With, know, with the uh, extortion. Yeah, with the yes. extortion. Yeah. You know, I, I almost, you know, I kind of thought that he wasn't going to be able to come up with the six. The yeah. fact that he was able to convince those two guys to give him to, you know, like, good on him. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's, he's been close to uh, going home a few different times. And, you know, he's been able to save himself. So, yeah. you know, I think he's just playing a goddamn good game right now. Yeah, I know he's come such a long way, and it seems like that Game Changers was uh, such a uh, like a teachable moment from him. It seemed like that uh, going out early, I think it humbled him and got him to you know go back and uh, really play a much more patient game, at least to get this season started. When you were at Ponderosa coming into Game Changers, mm -hmm. could you tell from Tony, the way Tony was acting, that he was about to go nuts once he hit the beach? I couldn't really tell that. Um, he, he's a pretty high-strung guy in, in general. Yeah. He's like, um, has like a little bit of the like ADD, like he just has to be moving, has to be doing stuff, has to be talking, has to be like somewhere. So I didn't get to see the extent of of his gameplay because i was on a different tribe from yeah him. yeah but, um you know you could you could definitely see where you know where like the the, the old school tony where it was and how he was going to play and that's why i'm just i'm impressed i'm impressed that he's been able to change his game just enough not too much but just enough to really take some of those cues and he i think he let other people drive for long enough that he was able to give himself, you know, that sort of under, under the radar, um, gameplay, but you know, he's, he's making his big moves now and that's what you got to do. 
So. So we saw Kim go out of the uh, game last night. Now, were, were you very familiar with Kim from her first season? I know it came right after uh, when you played in South Pacific, when she first won in One World. Yeah, I think I did. That's the one where Troy. we were introduced to Troy Zan. Yeah, Troy Zan's first season, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I do remember that, and I just thought that she was, you know, I, I, so far I've thought Kim has played an amazing game. And yeah, I really, I really had my hopes on her um, to make it um, because I think she's done some good moves and she just, you know, the, she just made a big mistake last night. And by taking that, by not putting in everything she had, she could still be in this game. So I was a little, I was familiar with her and I just, I thought she did a, I thought she did a great job on her first season. Mm-hmm. Now, Sarah is somebody that you played with in Game Changers. She's, uh, you know, working with Tony to this point. Do you see a way for Sarah to uh, either get to the end with Tony and win, or does she need to get rid of Tony to win again? I, I think Sarah has to get rid of Tony to win. Yeah. I just think that there's nobody, nobody who's playing right now on the – you know, who's still in the game. I don't think anyone can beat Tony at this point. Yeah. You know? But that's considering, you know, there's a lot of game left. There's a lot of moves. There's a lot of things people, you know, might, might look past it. If Sarah makes some big moves now, if she starts to really show what she can do, um, I think that it would take um, backstabbing Tony though, or at least taking out. Now, could Sarah win against Ben? I think so. Could she win against Jeremy? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I think Jeremy might be a little more likable. And mm-hmm. I think people might want to give, give it to him more. Um, but I think that Sarah definitely can't beat Tony. I think that she's got she's to get him out. Do you feel like that Sarah has played differently this season than uh, when she played with you in Game Changers? Um, I don't think Sarah's necessarily played that much different this season. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that she's been really lucky in her, the way that, you know, some of the, some of the earlier twists happen to put her in the right, on the right tribes and things. Um, I think that Sarah's also been really smart about how, you know, how and when to play under the radar and who and who to, who to trust and who not to trust. But I think Sarah played a damn good game in Game Changers. Mm -hmm. I think that her, um, you know, her knowing, knowing when to lie, who to lie to, when to like, when to backstab people. I think that she just, she played a great game. So I think that she's been a little, a little more under the radar than, than she should be at this point. Um, but again, she's still in the game, so she's got she's got a lot going for her. But she's also, I think, she's by aligning herself with Tony, and people now know that her and Tony are obviously working together. She's got a big target on her back as well. So she either needs to make a big move, or she needs to like hide behind someone else. I don't, I don't know. It, it it's looking harder and harder for her to win the game if she continues to just play with Tony and let Tony make what looks like all the, all the big calls. I went back and I listened to the exit interview that we did after uh, you got voted out on Survivor Game Changers. And, and I had asked you at that time, uh, who was the person that you felt most betrayed by of the people that voted against you? And you had said it was Sarah and you guys felt, and you felt like that you had had a, uh, a bond with her and it was a, you know, a, a real betrayal uh, in your mind for Sarah to vote against you. I feel like that this season we've seen a lot more about her being able to make these like uh, really strong social bonds with people. Whereas I feel like we didn't see that as much in game changers does that hurt more when somebody uh you know really is you know uh you know uh forming that that social bond with you before they ultimately uh turn their back on you um i don't know that was just that was probably me being a being just hurt you (laughs) know by by what i thought was friendship but you know i don't I don't think so. I think that your, 
you know, you're out there to make friends, but you're also out there to win. You're out there to like have a good time, but you know, you're out there to win. So, you know, I think that, um, I don't, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough question. You know, I just, yeah, I don't know, man. But you've never done that to anybody in uh, four seasons of playing the show. Is, is that fair to say that there was never a vote, unless I, I, this is one that I can't think of, where that you ended up turning against somebody who you had a friendship with in the game? No, not, not really. I mean, there was one. Yeah, I think I made a huge mistake voting Amy Cusack out in uh, fans versus favorites. Yeah. I think that that was one of the stupidest things that I've, I've ever done in Survivor. Um, yeah. I think that that, I listened to the wrong people. I didn't trust someone. I didn't trust Amy. Amy, I think, had all of my best intentions at heart. She knew about my idol. Um, and I think that getting rid of her at that time really like set the stage for me losing uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, it, it, it's, I'm not free of guilt at all. I've done that in the past. Um, and I understand the kind of toll that it has. And again, I think that not only did I, if I had done that and it had like proven to be a good move and I had been strategically set up to go further in the game because of it, maybe, but for me, that was just a stupid move. And I betrayed a friend that I had somebody that could have been a potential alliance, you know, in an alliance with me that could have been looking out for me later in the game. I had no reason to do that. Mm -hmm. And I did it. And it was, and I, I still regret to this day doing that. And not just because it, it fucked me over in a strategic way, but yeah. because Amy's just such a great person. And I couldn't see, I couldn't, I couldn't see that. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm a survivor mastermind. Yeah. What was the concern that she had uh, relationships with people on the other side? Was that what the, what the issue was? Because she said to Tracy and Chet, like, yeah, we're going to vote Ozzy out. She was probably just lying to them. And I, yeah. heard, you know, and it was just stupid. It was yeah, stupid. She was upset. She was upset like, that she wanted to like prove to you that she was loyal. Yeah. 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 It was so, it was so dumb. Yeah. You know, I, feel, I feel horrible about that. So I get it. I really do. And I understand, you know, you, you got to make hard decisions sometimes. And sometimes those decisions, you know, if, if, if I had been able to turn that to my advantage, voting out Amy, I'd still feel horrible about it, but at yeah. least I would have had some benefit. I just did something that was totally dumb and it didn't even benefit me. So it was even worse. Yeah. So I can see, like, I can totally understand, like, you know, I don't, I don't blame Sarah for voting me out at all. She, that was the right move. Yeah. So we saw last night, Tony, uh, we've seen him in the past. He's got the spy shack. He's built the spy bunker in Game Changers. Last night, he took to the air with the spy nest. Now, you are famous for your ability to climb trees out on Survivor. Ozzy, do you see value in a spy nest? Yeah, I can see value in a spy nest. I think um, I've thought about, you know, after seeing Tony do, do you know, use, his, use that move before, I've tried to do that. I've tried to, like, hide out and, like, yeah. you know, catch people talking. But I think that that's something that Tony does the best. And, you know, he might end up being able to use that. You yeah. might end up hearing the right conversation at the right time. You might just see two people that he didn't think were talking, talking. I mean, who knows? But I just think his, his antics are, are incredible. I, yeah. I, I want to see more of this. How long could you sit up there in the tree without anybody knowing that you're up there? I mean, you, can, you could probably be up there for a while, but yeah. eventually people are going to say, okay, either they're looking for an idol or they're up to no good. So yeah. regardless, like you're, you're being away from camp um, has its own dangers and limitations. So yeah. Who, if, is the risk worth the reward? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What did you think of Tony's ladder? Oh, man, that was... <laughs> I don't know what the hell he was doing with that, but yeah. it was, the only thing that I feel bad for is the breadfruit because those were obviously not ripe breadfruits. I don't even think they could eat them. But, you know, mm. I, like, I like all of the... Um, all of the antics that people get up to on Survivor. It's, it's, it's a nice break from the game. Yeah. So 
Ozzy, as we're doing this podcast, you're on video. I'm seeing you. Uh, you're wearing the camo shirt. Uh, when we first came on, you say, I'm like, hey, I'm, wear I'm wearing my shirt uh, to do this. And going back and watching you, yeah, you always have the camo shirt on. Was that just a wardrobe choice that they made for you in the beginning and it just stuck? Or is there a significance to you wearing the camo shirts? Um, no, that was my choice in the very beginning. Yeah. And, you know, I created the Aussie persona by wearing this camo. It's become my, my calling card. Just yes. like, you know, you'd feel weird about seeing Rob without his hat. Yeah. I, it's just one of those things that now I'm just, I just got it because I was like, well, if I'm going to be going out to be stranded on a deserted Island, you know, I thought, and I knew, you know, obviously I'd seen survivor. I was like, well, could be an advantage to be camouflaged, hiding in bushes, hearing people, you know, have conversations. Up in the spy nest. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you're, you're it's, ready. It's become, uh, it's become part of me. And, you know, I, I, now I just, I, I really, I like that it's part of my survivor look. Yeah. You know, when people think of you, you're so synonymous with doing so well in the challenges. And, you know, I think that you're an interesting case because that, um, as far as I know, you're not like a traditional athlete. Uh, I, I just would love to know in terms of like, uh, it seems like that you're all, always described as having like natural ability as opposed to you're not like a CrossFit guy or a marathon runner or have like a, like a, a, a long history, like in an organized sport. So, um, really how do you train for survivor and you know, how did you get so good at all of these things? That's a really tough question. Um, yeah, I think that there's, there's a few things that you can do that will help you kind of train to be on survivor. Um, I think that balance is mm -hmm. a huge part of it. I think being able to um, run a physical, run yourself physically, and then yeah. be able to use your mind in, in puzzles. I yeah. think it really is kind of like one of the hardest things to train on, but also part of what makes a really great um, individual immunity uh, player. Um, but I do you train I've, for Survivor? Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna go back, or is it just like you just have it in you and you're just good at what you're good at? No, I don't really train. Although in my younger days, I don't think I necessarily needed to per se. But mm -hmm. as I've gotten older and slower and mm -hmm. stupider, like I probably should. I I should probably just in case I get called back next year, or the year after. Yeah. Yeah. I should probably start training now for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, there's just a few things that I, that I do in my life that really help. Um, skateboarding, yeah. surfing, you know, doing like, like going camping for long periods of time. Those kinds of things help. But again, like I think that I just am lucky enough that, you know, running obstacle courses and, you know, playing, you know, just being, being agile um, has has been all I really needed to do. Yeah. What's your history with athletics from like before that you were ever on Survivor? Did you ever play any organized sports? Oh yeah, I played sports my whole entire life. So I've always been a swimmer. Um, I yeah. did I did diving. So I was a, a diver when I was in like uh, in middle school through high school. So you know, diving board diving. Um, I used to play soccer. I played football, wrestling, track, uh, rugby, um, frisbee, just mm -hmm. team sports in general. But, um, you know, my main sports were skateboarding and surfing, surfing. I've been surfing now since, you know, probably for 20, 25 years. Yeah. And that's been one of my, like, that's been one of the things that's really helped me almost the most in Survivor. Yeah. Uh, and you still do it? You're still uh, surfing when you can? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm surfing as much as possible. Um, I've gotten in the last few years, I've gotten really into ocean swimming and doing triathlons. So, you know, I'm trying to keep myself occupied with things that are going to 
you know, yeah. keep me in somewhat of physical shape and just in case, mm-hmm. just in case the producers yeah. decide to call me back. How about the fishing? Uh, is that something that you just tried for the first time on Survivor or had you uh, been able to do spear fishing uh, when, you know, previous to uh, going out there? Let's see. The first time I went out on Survivor, I I had I had spearfished a few times. Yeah. Nothing really like I wasn't very good at it. I just I kind of understood the basic concept, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And then Cook Islands, I just ended up being that guy and went out and had a just had a great time and just really learned that I had a natural aptitude for spearfishing and it just sort of became like Part of my thing that and like climbing coconut trees i don't think i'd ever actually tried to climb a coconut tree mm-hmm. i thought i could but I just once i was out there i was like all right well i'm gonna try it and then it turned out that i could do it of the different locations that you've been to uh, which one did you enjoy the most regardless of the outcome of the season uh which place did you like being in um south pacific so we we played in samoa that was yeah. where south pacific was that was one of my favorite locations. The reef was just absolutely beautiful. There was tons of coconuts. There was like ben- wild bananas and chili peppers. And like, there was a lot of food in abundance. Fiji has been, re- was really amazing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as like the reef and the natural environment. I, um, I had a bad feeling. I don't, this, this is, uh, so when, when Game Changers, that season happened, they're, you know, they film seasons back to back, right? Right. So Gen X versus Millennials as they shot right before. And, you know, we all know there was this like big part of that season where there was a cyclone that went through yes. and it just ripped, it ripped, it, it, it toppled a bunch of trees. It ripped every single coconut and every single palm frond off of every single tree on the entire islands of Fiji. So when Game Changers started, there was zero coconuts on any tree. And I was like, my game's over. I'm like, I'm not gonna win. There's no yeah. coconuts on the trees. I'm, I can't do what I'm like, I wanna do. So I had a bad feeling about that from, uh, from day one on Game Changers that I wasn't gonna- That was a bad omen, that the coconuts were there. O- it was yeah. a bad omen for me. And I was like, ah, crap, I'm, I'm screwed. So. You know, that might have been another thing with my mental, my mental game. I talked myself out of it from the very beginning. All right. Let me ask you some of these questions from uh, the listeners. Uh, Ron from Toronto wants to know, Ozzy, did any of the players reach out to you for advice or intel on the other players before the season? Uh, did anybody reach out to you for a scouting report on what's it like to play with this other person? No. 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 But has, any- that, has that ever happened? Well, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Yes. You know, CBS, the producers are, well, let's just say the, sure. the, the production is very, very, very clear about pregame alliances, about people talking to each other, and for good reason, because seasons like this, I can guarantee you people were talking. Mm-hmm. I can guarantee people were talking. Everybody knows, you know, what... The, the, our community is small yeah. and when the rumor mill starts happening, you know, people start to talk. I was not, nobody asked me specifically about any one person that's played the game, but I can almost guarantee you that there either there was pregame alliances or people just have unspoken. I mean, look, when we go to events yeah. and we, you know, have had a couple drinks, we're often make really bad jokes we're like hey me and you we're going to the end if we ever play together we're yeah. you know. so these kinds of like and this has been a theme of the show you know the people that have that have known each other and have had relationships versus people that have few relationships and it's kind of part of the um the the difficulty of navigating a season full of winners is you know everybody's got these past relationships so how do you make sure you know if 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 I had known, for example, that Troy Zan and um, and and Brad were such good friends, like I didn't know that they were good friends. Yeah, like, they, were, they are good friends outside of the game. They knew each other outside of the game. If I had known that going into the game, would have completely changed the way I played Game Changers. 
It wasn't until after I was done and voted off that I, that somebody told me like, yo, yeah, they're friends. Like they, they, they are in alliance together because they're homies. It's like, ah, I should have known that, you know, that's part of my bad. I didn't know, like, I didn't, I'm not that embedded in the community that I know, like who knows who, whose relationships are with who. So, yeah. It could backfire too, because I think that probably people would have said, uh, like, oh, like, well, Ozzy knows poverty uh, in Micronesia. So, uh, and then it could also be the kind of thing where then, you, you know, you don't, you're not looking for uh, that kind of a betrayal from somebody that you know before, also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I, but specifically that question, no, nobody, nobody mm-hmm. asked about any of the, uh, the returning players. Okay. Hunter wants to know, uh, Ozzy, who was your favorite castaway to play with? Was there like one person that you were out there with that was really just the most fun to be around? Um, let's see. Most fun to be around. Somebody asked me this the other last night and you know, this is a player that didn't have a lot of time in the game. Yeah. Yeah and was on my first season of Cook Islands. Okay. And it's somebody that I would love to see come back. And it's somebody that I had a, a blast with on the show. And that was Cowboy. Cowboy. Yeah. 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 Cowboy <laughs> Cowboy was was a was a wild man. He was yeah. insane. He had amazing stories. Yeah. He really like didn't give up about anything. Yeah. He just yeah. kind of like was out there to have a blast. He's somebody that I, I just, I really enjoyed playing with. Yeah. I enjoyed who he was, how much of a wild card he was, and I would love <laughs> to see him come back. Yeah. He's somebody that I would love to uh, talk to sometime because uh, that he seemed like such an interesting character on the show. Uh, what happened the day that you guys just uh, showed up at one of the other camps, right? Do I, oh. do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so crazy. What, I'm, you guys just got in the boat or it was the same island and you just walked all the way to, and you popped up at the, uh, at the other camp? Nah, it was, so we, we had these outrigger canoes and, yeah. um, you know, I just got it in my head one day. We were like in between, we were on one of the like off days. We didn't have a challenge. So it's kind of like do whatever you want day. And I think it was, was it Cowboy Flicka and myself? I, 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 if I had to guess, I think that's who it was, but don't quote me on so. it. Yeah. And, you know, we were, so in Cook Islands, it's a number, it's a, it's a toll. So you have like, yeah. there was another island that was, it didn't look that far away. It was like, you know, probably a good 20 minute paddle in the canoe. Mm-hmm. And I was looking, this was my first season. So I didn't realize how things work. Like I didn't know yeah. like, okay, they're, there's probably another tribe over there. You couldn't really see. It was far enough away that you couldn't see people. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, hey, let's go explore. Let's go to that island and maybe we can find some like fruit or yeah. who knows what's there. You know, and I just, Flicka and uh, Cowboy were the ones that seemed excited about it. So I was like, all right, guys, let's go. Yeah. That's crazy. Like, I, I, I can't even remember. I can't even believe they let us do that. Well, that's what I was going to say, that no producers were like, hey, actually, guys, uh, that's the other camp over there. That uh, you, can't, you can't do that. Yeah, well, I think that it was so early in, you know, that kind of thing hadn't been done yeah. on the show yet. So I think like, they let's were see like, what happens. let's yeah. see what happens. <laughs> and it's kind of cool because I think that, that us doing that sort of opened the door for some other twists that happened you know, later on this, the season. Yeah. Perfect example is the advantages that Sarah got where she could sneak into the other camp. Yeah. And, like, get the idol from somebody. You know, I think that that is super cool. I really like that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, we didn't really use it to our advantage. Like I didn't know what I was doing when I first played, like showing up on that other Island, I probably could have like, could have made like really cool relationships with Parvati or Nate or any of the other people yeah. that were there. And like, tried to use that later on, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that was that the, the funny thing about that story is we left in the kind of in the morning, we went to the Island and then when we decided to go back, the wind had started blowing really hard and it took us like, like I thought that we were going to be out of the game. I thought we were going to sink our boat because we picked up and it took us like an hour and a half to paddle back to the Island. So like it was, I was like kind of, I 
I kind of got a little bit scared, not that I was going to drown or anything, but I thought maybe we were going to sink our boat or like not be able to get back. I had no idea what was going to happen, but it was, it wasn't, it, it was pretty close that we, we didn't make it back to the, our island. Yeah, that's wild. Um, let me ask you a question from Baby Andy, who says, Ozzy, you were a finalist, and then you were on the jury three times. How did your views as a jury member evolve over your career? Uh, how does it take, uh, or what does it take to be worthy of being the sole survivor? You know, I think it's very interesting. So the first time you played, you ended up being the person who's in that final three. And then you then go on to sit uh, and, and you know have a seat at these uh, three other final tribal councils. Do you feel like, uh, before I let you answer uh, baby Andy's question, uh, if it was flipped around, if you had been to three tribal councils, final tribal councils before you sat in the final three, do you think that that would have been different? Would you have uh, like, uh, taken a lot of uh, things that you learned from the other final tribal councils? Let's see. So to answer that last part first, I think that if I had been to three tribals as a jury member and then been able to sit as, you know, as a final two or three, I definitely would have, would have played. I would have, it would have changed the way that I spoke to the jury. Yeah. And I would have highlighted a little more of what I had done strategically. Um, and I would have just, I would have, I would have, I would have uh, spoken differently to the jury. Now, mm -hmm. the hard part is, is going first and at making it to the end, uh, my first season, and then going back and being a jury member, I voted for people for my reasons, not for any other reasons. So I never voted for any winners. So coming back, I didn't vote for the winners. I voted for Amanda. I voted for uh, Culpepper. And I voted for... Um, Sophie. Yes. No. Sophie. So Sophie, I guess I yeah. did vote yeah. for her. So I, you got so one. I, so I did. I think I voted for Sophie. I don't even remember. I, <laughs> I, think, you, I think you did because I know that uh, that coach over the years, I've, I've heard him uh, talk about how that he felt like as a fellow returning player, he felt like that you should have voted for him. Yeah. Well, just a little bit on that. Coach is full of shit. <laughs> okay. So, you know what? Coach... If, and and coach, coach reached out to apologize to me a few years ago saying, like, for one, him shit-talking after the game was over. Yeah. Uh, my play was, like, wrong. Yes. Two, that he should have – it should have been him and I sitting in the final together. Yeah. Because I think that would have been the most amazing season. I think that would have been a real – and I think he would have had a real shot at yeah. playing if he had been truthful about it. Yeah. I tried my hardest to give him – the ammunition to win that final tribal, like I said, right. I win that softball. So, you know, I yeah. think the coach, coach was definitely hurt that I didn't vote for him, but I gave him the opportunity and I gave him a softball so yeah. he could have. So I think that, you know, just to go back to that question, you know, being able to, um, what, what deserves to win, um, I think – my metric is probably a lot different than other people's metric because I know, for example, if Brad Culpepper had been a little bit nicer to people and wasn't Brad Culpepper, I think he would have won that game mm -hmm. uh, because of what, because of his immunity run that he went in, in the end and how he was able to play. I think that, that people discounted his strategy because he was kind of an asshole. Yeah. And I think that if he had just been a little nicer, I think, and he wasn't Mr. Culpepper from the NFL. You know, I think that he actually played a damn good game. Um, you know, and I, and I look at that and I look at what it takes as a physical competitor to go on an immunity run and know that if you lose, you're out of the game and know that that's the kind of pressure that you feel from that. I, I, I place a little more value on that than just being a liar. You know, I place a little more value on that knowing that you got to win than just you know, being able to lie really well to people. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's just my own personal uh, thing. And not only was Brad a, um, not only was he a physical competitor and did really well in the immunity challenges and did make some strategic moves, but he was also just a badass around camp and really like, you know, he would fish and catch stuff and do all the things that I, I, I think are really great about Survivor. So mm -hmm. the problem with him is, you know, he just wasn't, he wasn't, 
likable. He was, he was, yeah. he was, he made a big fuss. He was constantly just like yap, yapping away and, mm-hmm. and uh, making, you know, when you uh, get, go on lockdowns, when you're going from one place yep, to the yep. other, he would just be talking shit and like back talking to uh, the producers. And at a certain point, it's like, cool. At other points, you're just like, oh, dude, just shut up. Yeah. And you're like, you're pissing everybody off. Like you're pissing them off. You're pissing content that your contestants off. Like you just got to shut up and be a nice right, guy. Right. Right. So. Um, to go back to your final tribal council, uh, in Cook Islands, you know, yeah. I, I actually think that you did, uh, you know, uh, a, a good job in that final tribal council that I feel like that, you know, uh, you'll, you know, I, I think that that's not a great, uh, environment for him to like be able to like to, to be called out for things. And I think that the way that you speak, uh, to people, I think it's a little bit more like you are like, uh, I think that the same things that you're calling coach out for, I think that you, in terms of like being upfront and honest with people, I think that that's actually a good skill set for the final tribal council. Uh, so it was a five, four vote, uh, super close. Uh, it, so I was watching some of that, uh, today and I believe it, I think it's Jenny Guzon Bay. Uh, yeah. she asked you in the final tribal council, she asked everybody about, uh, or what's the hardest thing that you've had to overcome to get to this point? And you told um, you, t- you talked about how that the hardest thing for you was that you had a uh, a relationship with with your dad where uh, you were you were not close and it was uh, very hard for you because that your dad wasn't uh, ever uh, a part of your life uh, and that was something that uh, you know uh, was uh, a really hard thing for you and, and I you know I have uh, wondered. Did you ever end up, you know, uh, rekindling uh, that relationship in all the years since then in terms of like when the show was on and, you know, all of the fame that you had because of Survivor? Yeah, I mean, that was, it was difficult because I think that being confronted with your, you know, how you lived your life up to that point um, was something I wasn't really expecting as a question. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think being able to kind of like open myself up and be vulnerable, not only to everybody who was, um, you know, on the jury, but also the millions of people watching at home. Yeah. Um, it wasn't something that I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know where I was going with that question. I just, she asked the question and it was something that you know, one of the hardest parts of, of, of my life up to that point. And so taking the opportunity to really like let people in, I'm, I'm really glad that I did. I think that it's, it helped me to sort of reconcile um, the decisions that my father made growing up, um, you know, as I was growing up and being sort of absentee. Um, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't able to really do too much to repair the relationship. Um, You know, we just, we had always lived different lives. And even though I, you know, I I made it, even though I made it very like public, my, uh, my journey trying Mm -hmm. to come to terms with, you know, what it's like to, 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 you know, confront a a person, a parent that's not been there in your life. um, You know, I just wasn't able to ever make, make up for that lost time. And I I tried and we, you know, we, we definitely were, um, you know, we had an opportunity and I, you know, I, I I did what I could, but he was living in Mexico and ended up, you know, he passed away a few years ago and I still regret not being, you know, not going back and just kind of like letting go of the resentment that I had, uh, him not being around when I was a child. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that I would hope would inspire people that if anyone else is out there that has a sort of a, a relationship with a, with a, with a, with a, their mom or dad that wasn't around that, you know, you can see past their, you know, their shortcomings and just know that someday they're not going to be there and you're not going to be able to go back and you're not going to be able to change the past. But all you can really do is try to repair things about, your relationship now and going forward in the future. 
And, you know, we can resent people that have hurt us, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere. And it mm -hmm. really creates um, pain and suffering in our own selves. So I think that if any, if it just helps a couple people, if it helps one person, I'm glad that I made that, um, that part of my personal life uh, really public because I think that it's important. And I'm not saying I'm a perfect person and I'm, I, I have a lot that I need to work on, mm -hmm. but knowing that, you know, you've got to forgive transgress people's transgressions. And, you know, a lot of times people are really trying their hardest and I didn't, you know, I, I held on to that for way too long. And the, the experience of being on survivor and sort of using that platform to kind of talk about those things that really hurt me, it's helped me to heal and it's helped me to overcome and it's helped me to, um, to, to understand that, you know, if you can try to repair the relationship and at least just understand that that's, that's, that's just something that, that happened and you've got to, you got to deal with it. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you sharing all of that because I think that it's uh, going to really uh, leave a lot of people uh, very touched to hear that story. So uh, thank you for you know opening up about that. I'm sure it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let me ask you uh, this question from Scott Chernoff who wants to know, Ozzy, you've played with so many winners. Is there something that they all have in common as players? Uh, does any trait set them apart from the other players, or does it mostly come down to timing and luck? Do you feel like that you know you've been around uh, these uh, all these people who have uh, gone on to win the game? Uh, Parvati, Sandra, Sophie, uh, uh, Yule. Uh, is there some, is there one thing that you could put your finger on that all of them have? Man, that's a tough question. I don't know if there's one thing that they all have. I think they've all got, um, they've all got a lot of similar qualities, but I don't necessarily think there's any one thing besides, you know, there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of uh, timing involved. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily think there's any one thing. I don't think there's any one type of person. I think that lots of different types of people can win this game. I think that, you know, sometimes it does all come down to luck. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, if, if I had to play devil's advocate, I could tell you this, that somebody who's never won the game, um, that should have won somebody like Suri, mm -hmm. uh, I think that she exemplifies a player that uh, had everything going for them, was playing a perfect game and she just got so unlucky on game changers Yeah, and where everybody had an advantage except for her. Mm -hmm. and so she got sent home. I think that Sari was in a position to win that game. I think she was doing a great job. And I think Sari would be an example of somebody I, I, I would say who, who has almost all that it takes, um, but she just got unlucky. So I think that you can have people that do have what it takes and, and they get lucky. So I don't, I don't necessarily say that there's one quality that they all have, that they all have in common. I think everybody that I've played against that's won the game um, has, you know, some, some had a little more luck than others, but, you know, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's just one overarching quality that they all share. Can Suri win ever, do you think? I think Suri can win. I think Suri can win. I think that she just would need, you know, she would just need a, like uh, one little bit of luck to go her yeah. way, you know, but I think that she could definitely win. I think that her, um, her ability to uh, play socially with people is one of her biggest strengths. I think that she's like, got an amazing nose for a lie mm -hmm. Knows when people are telling the truth and when they're not. And I think that that skill in and of itself, if there was going back to that previous question, if there was anything that could 
give you that little bit of advantage is just being as astute socially as possible. And if you've got that one, yeah. little moment, I think that does give you more of an advantage than anyone else. And I'm not saying that, that necessarily Sophie had that or because I think that, that it was again, coaches game to lose that, that time. But I think you will have that. I think Parvati definitely has that. Mm-hmm. Um, so your, your, um, your, your social awareness, I think, would have to be, if, if any of any quality, the social awareness, you know, you've got to be your, uh, your empathy and your ability to, uh, to, to sense that is probably going to be the number one quality. But I, I do think Sari could win, and I'd love to see her win. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, a lot of us would like to see it. I just want to like, uh, I just feel like Game Changers was like the perfect scenario where she's right there and then runs into that buzzsaw with all the advantages. Um, in fans versus favorites, uh, that, you know, there had been a final three ever since, you know, you were part of the first final three. Uh, there's, a, there's a final three in Survivor 14, Survivor 15. Uh, and then because of, uh, I don't know if it was the medical evacuations or what, final two that season. Uh, it's been debated for many years. If, if there is a final three, does Suri win fans versus favorites final three? Yes, you say? I say yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she has enough votes there. If it's a seven person, uh, f- that, uh, that um, you're probably still going to vote for Amanda. Are there enough votes left there for Suri? I think so. I think so. I think that Suri, um, God, I can't remember who else was on the jury at that point. It was, it was Eliza, mm-hmm. Alexis, me, Natalie, and Jason mm-hmm. and uh, Eric. Yeah, and I'm forgetting somebody. Uh, Alexis, you have her. Alexis, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think that um, you know, you know, actually, that's that's really that's difficult because Parvati did a great job um, getting Alexis, getting Natalie. Yeah. Um, even Eric to some extent, I think she did a great, then Jason and Eliza. God, that, you know, that's a, that's a toss up. That's really yeah. difficult. I think that she could have done it. Um, but you never know. I think Suri also has the gift of gab. Yeah. I think she'd be great good. in that final tribal council. She would have been great, but yeah. I also think that one of the, 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 um, one of the qualities that is, you know, it's hard to pinpoint hard to give, you know, you don't know how much weight to give it, but the fact that Suri is a mother has, you know, worked her ass off and since she was a little kid and, you know, there's a, her backstory, mm-hmm. I think would give her an advantage in a, in a final tribal against, you know, two young, beautiful girls that have everything going for them. I think that Suri could make an amazing case for why she deserves to win. And I think that I would have voted for that, you know, if I, if I didn't have my love blinders on. <laughs> I would see that as being like, look, she's a, she's a, she's a nurse, has a bunch of kids. Yeah, like she's, yeah. She deserves it, you know, and yeah. she's one of those people that went from sitting on her couch to, you know, being final, final tribal. So, yeah. Um, this is a question from Troy Steinmetz. Uh, Jeff loves to call out people at tribal who step down from challenges for rewards. As a jury member, how much should people factor something like that into a vote? Uh, you obviously love the challenges, but you probably also know that not every challenge is a fit for every player. And someone who isn't going to win may strategically opt out to get some calories. Uh, should that bother you as a juror? We saw like the jury reacting to uh, Jeff said, uh, by the way, everybody, Kim and Michelle and Nick stepped down for peanut butter. Uh, even poverty was like, Kim, how could you? Well, it's, it, it, it does depend, but I think, yeah, I think that it was a, it was a huge mistake on Kim's part. Mm-hmm. That was a huge mistake. Um, you don't, you don't really know as part of the jury, is that gonna is that gonna weigh on your decision whether yeah. to vote for someone or not? I don't necessarily think that I'm gonna give that. That's not gonna weigh weigh my vote that much. Um, I might see somebody if there was a really obvious way to uh, 
to get an advantage by opting out to somehow like put votes on someone else. I don't know. Maybe there would be some strategic reason, but I wouldn't put a lot of, uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't put a lot of weight behind it. Um, it's, it's, it's your game to lose. So Kim made a huge mistake by not putting, giving it her all. Um, and I think that, you know, she's really the, she's probably sitting there watching, knowing that like that could have been her game right then and there. Yeah. Just to um, stick with this idea about, uh, you know, going for it in all of the challenges, you know, uh, Tyson, who I, I do feel like that uh, you and he have like sim- similarities as a player. And in this, in the season that he won, he ultimately had an injury, uh, and, but he milked the injury for that people thought that all of a sudden Tyson is always, always getting voted out because they, they say, oh, Tyson's so good in the challenges. Uh, he'll win the challenges if we keep him around. And then in the season that he won, he had this injury that he really ended up like uh, like over-exaggerating how hurt he was to the point where it actually diminished his threat level. And he's also somebody that talks about how that he would often, when he, given the chance to eat or compete, he wants to eat because that he wants to sort of like uh, maybe not look as perfect to people where like it kind of pisses people off a little bit about him. And then, then people don't say, oh, I've got to go to the end and sit with him that I, I wonder, Ozzy, could this, uh, could this work for you, Ozzy? In the same way that Tony said, hey, if I go out and go look for idols, then people will vote me out. Tony had to like resist his superpower to ultimately get to the point in the game where now he can look for the idols that I, I wonder, like, uh, could you take a page out of this book? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. I've been taking notes. Yes. Um, yes. I, I, I have told myself after game changers that if I ever get the, the amazing opportunity to go back and play that I'm not going to be the spear fisherman that I have been in the past. Yes. I'm not going to play the, the same way that I've played in the past that I'm going to change my game. I have to. Um, it's just, it's old. It's an old, you know, it's an old hat at this point to keep going out and providing fish and like being gone from camp and doing, you know, that was just such a, um, you know, I had my chance to do that and I can't play that way again. And I don't even think I would necessarily need to play it up. I'm almost 40 years old. Like yeah. if I ever get a chance to play again, like I'm not going to be the same young guy. I'm not going to have the same amount of stamina, ability, yeah. like anything that I had when I was 25. I'm just not. So I don't even think I would have to try that hard. You know, it would just be about resisting the temptation to like want to get back into my old, my old tricks. So mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've seen how Tyson was able to win that game and I've seen how other people have milked um, injuries. I've seen how, you know, sort of not trying to be this like perfect person can actually be really advantageous and really help. So yeah. I think that, you know, whoever just asked that, Thank you. Um, hopefully, if I ever play again, people forget about this and mm-hmm. I can maybe utilize that. Yeah, much. I mean, we're two hours into this. Uh, yeah. I mean, who's, who's <laughs> like, uh, the, what players are listening to this stuff? Um, but in terms of uh, you and Tyson, again, uh, again, I think that um, just in thinking of where Tyson is right now, his goal is to be, you know, at, at least Ozzy in South Pacific and come back into the game for a second time. It, what's interesting is that in the season he won, he had to stave off that person where Tina comes back from the uh, Redemption Island in that season and he had to deal with how to untangle the okay how do I uh, make sure I knock out the person who's come back from the Redemption Island do you think that that would give him an advantage in terms of when he comes back knowing what to do to be able to get to the end Say that one more time. So you no, think when, that- when he comes, do you think he has any advantage in having to, he's lived through going through, okay, somebody's come back at the final six. How do I uh, ultimately untangle that knot to get to the end without letting that person in? Yeah, I think that Tyson has all of this. The, he's got all of the tools at his disposal to be able to come back and be like an underdog winner. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really think that, that we can't discount him or Boston Rob for that matter mm-hmm. at this point. Um, I think that 
Rob has a little more of a, will have a little more of a harder time doing it because mm -hmm. I think that Rob just being Boston Rob and the power duo with Amber, I think they've had a pretty good advantage this whole time. Um, so I think that it'll be hard if, if, if say Rob was able to come back in, I think it'll be harder for Rob to make the case mm -hmm. than Tyson. I think that Tyson does have um, a way with words and a way with people and is a very likable person. And I yeah. think he's, he's smart enough to know how to do that. So I'm not saying that Rob isn't, but I think yeah. that Rob's got a little more of a difficult uh, battle with that. You know, um, I, I haven't really even asked you anything about uh, uh, a couple of the people that you've played with in this season. Uh, what have you thought about Yule uh, and uh, that his his journey uh, so far in this season? Uh, how, how do you feel like that uh, he ended up doing? Um, I think that, you know, I had high hopes that Yule was going to do better than he did. Mm -hmm. Um I don't necessarily think that Yule is like a, he's got a physique out of like, a, you know, he's like mm -hmm. a Greek god, right? Yeah. He's, he's in better shape now, I think, than when you guys played. Yeah, I think so. You know, and he, that's what, he's, he's always been very impressive in, in that, but he's never been like the strongest at challenges. Mm -hmm. He's just never been that good at like individual challenges. I don't know if he's ever even won an individual immunity. Well, in fairness to Yule, that he had to go up against you. How many times did he come in second? That's true. That's true. But I just don't see him as being um, a contender for getting back in the game. Mm -hmm. I had hoped that he would have played a little more of a strategic game. Um, I was hoping to see just a little more... I don't know. I just, I, I thought that he might be able to be a little more flexible in it and be able to adapt to this new style of play. But I think it was just a little too fast for him. Mm -hmm. And I also think that he got, um, he got a little too comfortable and didn't realize, you know, that, uh, uh who was it that went, was it Wendell that, that, yeah. that, uh, that he was trying to get Wendell uh, voted out and then Wendell right. stayed. He had the relationship with Michelle uh, and then and Nick also voted against Yule. Yeah. So, you know, that's un unfortunate for Yule. I think that mm. he just didn't, he just didn't quite see, you know, the, the, the relationships that were happening. And something also that I think that bit him in the ass is the fact that he confronted Tice or he had confronted Wendell after that tribal council. Yeah. So he kind of put himself on Wendell's radar. And, you know, I think that you, you saw like the, what a great person Yule is because he was trying to like help his Alliance member. He's trying mm -hmm. to like, you know, talk about his feelings to Wendell and Wendell was like, yo man, you're trying to get me out. Like, you're done. <laughs> right, you know? right. I, think that, I, I don't think that, I think Yule was playing a little more of the like older classic version of Survivor that he did well at. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he was able to change his game enough for this season. Were you surprised that uh, when Parvati and Yule ended up on the same tribe, that there was like nothing, nothing, no relationship, uh, that, you know, uh, Parvati ends up getting voted out? And in hindsight, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if uh, Yule gets voted out next, maybe if he can figure out something to do with Parvati there in that spot, uh, that he can stick around. Oh, yeah. I think that um, it's it's unfortunate that, that Yule didn't utilize his past relationship with Parvati. Yeah. Um, and maybe he tried and Parvati wasn't having it, but something tells me that there, she was getting voted out. I think she would have had something to do with it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that Yule missed an opportunity there. And it's again, I, you, you know, in hindsight, you can play the game a lot of different ways, yeah. but when you're in it, Yule might've just looked at it and said, you know, Hey, I'm in a great position. Yeah. Why it's would I, why would I throw away these relationships for somebody that's on the chopping block? It's an easy vote, but you know, you never know. You never yeah. really know. Ozzy, it was like, why couldn't they uh, remember the glory days from the hot tub? I know. With, with oh, uh, Yule and Parvati. Uh, we had such, that was such <laughs> a fun reward. Way back when. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was incredible.
Yeah. Uh, so no, no luck there. Okay. Um, and then, oh, you know, Sandra, I, I so you saw that you were one, there was one episode where you were live tweeting where Sandra got uh, voted out. You seemed like that you were really impressed with what Denise did when Sandra got knocked out of the game. So impressed. So impressed. I, you know, I thought that, let's see, I'm trying to remember what happened. So Sandra, she got the she the Denise had an idol and Sandra said here I'll I'll give you an idol for two fire tokens and then you write down Tony's name and we'll all vote for you. Yeah, yeah, and Denise did end up writing down Tony's name, didn't? No, Denise? she wrote down Sandra's name. Oh, she did she everything did. that Sandra said except she wrote down Sandra instead of Tony. So she fully just like lied. She fully lied, but mm -hmm. you know what, Denise, that was a power move. That was a power move. I was so impressed with that. Yeah. Um, and I thought that like, you know, if you, if you can somehow make it to the end and you didn't, you don't have moves like that, if you can't show on your resume that you made some, some, some really risky strategic moves, then, you know, you don't deserve to win the game. Um, you might still win, but I think that Denise, Denise really showed what it takes, um, to get further and to really, um, well, well, I'll say two things. I think Denise just, that was an amazing move for one. And I think that Sandra kind of like, I think she was trying to come up with a good move herself. Yeah. I think that she sensed there's something happening. Um, and, you know, let's be honest. She's, what are you going to let Sandra win for a third time? Like, mm -hmm. you know, her chances of getting to the end were, were very small. Yeah. Um, but she did whatever she could. I, I, I think that, you know, I think that she probably just thought that it was it, it was all the all the move that she had, and so God bless her. You know, she did what she could, um, and it came back to bite her in the butt. Um, but Denise, you know, taking that risk and knowing and and having that that wherewithal to play the way she did was it was beautiful. All right, uh, a couple more questions for you, yeah. Ozzy. Kevin Epley wants to know how would Ozzy handle Tony's eccentric behavior if you were allied together? Uh, would you be able to trust him, or you would you be trying to find a way out? I think that I'm one of the few people that that could potentially, you know, I'm not. I don't know how I would have played this game. Yeah, but I think I'm one of the few people that would be comfortable staying aligned with Tony. I think that Tony is actually like the kind of guy that I'd want to be aligned with from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Everything that Tony's doing would, would, would work for my game because yeah. he's got a bigger target. Yeah. He's making big moves, but hopefully there'd be room to like also make some big moves. So I think that I would be, I'd be excited to work with Tony. But this wouldn't bother you, Ozzy, where now like uh, put yourself like in the Sarah role where now you're working, you're working with Tony and now you go to, you, you have a plan, you go to tribal council and a, a completely different person that you were working with gets voted out at the tribal council. That wouldn't drive you crazy? Oh, that would drive me absolutely crazy. Yeah. I, would, I would want my emotional self would want to say, you're done, Tony. Get out of here. You sunk my game. I'm ruined. But you got to know that, like, by him doing that, he's got that big target on his back now. Mm -hmm. And hopefully he's not going to win another immunity. And, yeah, he's got a hidden immunity idol. Uh, but he's only got, you know, he's, he's, he's skating on the edge. So Sarah, I think Sarah can see that she's got to make some big moves. Um, she knows that, I think she's smart enough to know that Tony's beating her right now. And she's got to do something to come out on top. So I think that luckily for Sarah, Tony's kind of like made the, he's drawn first blood. So if you've got an alliance with somebody and your alliance member lies to you to, for an advantage so they can get further in the game, you know, they've kind of like opened themselves up. So mm -hmm. if Sarah backstabs Tony or has to lie to Tony, she kind of has free car. She's kind of got a carte blanche right now to do whatever she wants. And hopefully she does. Sarah could win this game as well. If Sarah becomes the two-time winner of Survivor, is she the best ever? No, I won't say she's the best ever. Okay. I, I, I you know, I think that, I think that, I think that that's, that's a really, really, to give somebody the title of best ever, I think that for somebody like Sarah, I think she'd have to do a little bit more. Um, but 
you know, that might just be me being mm-hmm. like, you know, not wanting to, uh, not wanting to admit that she's a great player. Yeah. Um, but don't you want to be beat by a great player? Yeah. 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 For sure. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. But again, like if, if Tony becomes uh, a two time winner, are we going to, you know, are we going to say that he's the best ever? I think that there, there, there are a lot of players here yeah. that, that could potentially wear that, that crown of best ever. The problem is, is in a game like this, again, you also have so much luck involved and you could be the best player to never win. You know, you could be just based off of your luck. Um, yeah. Well, I you could be. That, well, yeah. I mean, I think that somebody like, like uh, if Rob, for example, is yeah. able to, if, if he's able to somehow win this uh, game, you know, he could potentially be one of those people I might consider saying is the best ever. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe. Um, Scott Michael has a question. Uh, We've seen a number of uh, different facial hair and hair combos from Ozzy throughout his Survivor career. What does Ozzy consider the peak of his hair slash facial hair game? (laughs) Um, If you were going to commission the Ozzy statue for the Island of the Idols, what what would be the the hair and facial hair that you'd want to see? Let's see. I I would want to be like probably day thirty eight. <laughs> yes, Ozzy from South Pacific. Or oh, like, that's very specific. Where I'm like thin. Yeah, I got like nice hair. My I'm not like I'm not quite balding as much yet. Like it's still all there, you know. So season, so day thirty eight yeah. before even drinking that first beer. Yeah, uh, on uh, South. Okay, Pacific. all right. That is P- that's peak Ozzy for the statue. For all sure. Right. Uh, this is where speaking of statues. Uh, Ryan Alexander says uh, we know Ozzy's a legendary challenge performer, probably the best of all time. I'd be curious to know who would Ozzy put on the Mount Rushmore of challenge beasts, or should it just be the four Ozzies? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I actually think that I did really well on Cook Islands, but I think that you know I don't. I didn't perform as well on a lot of the individual immunities mm-hmm. after that, that I, that I should have. So I think that there are, um, yeah, there's a couple of other people that are just, were absolutely incredible. I mean, I think Tom Westman, you know, yeah. he's still, and Terry Dietz, you yeah. know, I think, I think that those guys are the just, older guys. Yeah. They're powerhouses and they, they actually inspire me. So, and I mm-hmm. hope that if I ever go back that I can like be as physically, um, physically present as yeah. I was when I was in my early 20s. How many um, individual immunities have you won? I have no idea. No I idea. Really yeah, I, okay. I, I'm sure there's fans out there that have stats on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that if you take into consideration my, 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 uh, the, my, my wins on Redemption Island, yes. if you add that, somehow add that into... That's, then, yeah, then that's yeah, a lot. Maybe, maybe awesome. I'm up there, but I don't... Yeah, I don't, I think I'm a physical player, but I do think that there are, you know, there's other, there's other guys and girls out there that are better than me for sure. Yeah. Um, I had one other question about that. I, I can't remember. So I'll go on to the next one. Abby Maria said, uh, how do you stay so good looking? LOL, JK, ha ha ha. So I'm not sure then, uh, what is, what, what part was she kidding about? Um, <laughs> I don't know, Abby. That's a good question. Thanks for that. But in all seriousness, um, I think the only way to, 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 to sort of fend off the uh, aging is yes. I keep myself properly pickled and I try not to yes. give a fuck. You know, okay. I think that yeah. part and part, you know, you got to do a little bit of both. Yeah. What, what's your favorite drink? Uh, tequila. Tequila. Far. And what do you drink it with? Lime. lime lime just yeah. tequila with, straight up with lime yeah it's a good tequila or any other uh cactus spirit any other agave spirit yeah with a little bit of ice and lime that's good day. and i like to drink beer of course but and i'm a i'm a you know I'm, i've been in the restaurant business my yes half like my whole life so i'm uh 
you know, a, a sommelier. So I love wine. I love, I love to, you know, I love to imbibe. But if I had to choose one thing, it would be agave spirits with a little bit of lime and, uh, and uh, ice. That's it. Okay. I remember what I wanted to ask you about the challenges. Do you feel like had the challenges changed now where that I feel like even like the challenge that we saw last night, I feel like that everything is like, uh, especially when we get to after the merge, it's quick. Uh, like, hey, all right, this challenge where it would have been a six hour challenge uh, in season 16. Uh, we're going to do this. Uh, how do we do this challenge in 15 minutes? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, There's I, a lot of st oh, everybody stand in a place and hold this thing for as long as you can. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the logistics of you know some of those some of those really like arduous marathon challenges that that test your endurance. I think that they they should be used in really special occasions, mm -hmm. um, and that could be you know in like a, uh, uh, you know, a, a for fifth place or fourth place or something mm -hmm. like, you know, right around there. But yeah, I do sense that they have changed. And I think that they're just trying to give people, you know, maybe more opportunity to scramble at tribal or yeah. scramble at, uh, uh, back before going to tribal. So, you know, the way that you, you, you know, if you have a huge challenge that takes up a large, large portion of the day, then you go back to the beach and you only got an hour to scramble that might might not end up being as as conducive right. to great great tv yeah it's interesting that you know the challenges i feel like that they used to be a lot more of like all right everybody all right so go all right this doesn't hurt now but you'll an hour from now you'll really be feeling it whereas every this is all now like all right go all right this person's out this person's out this person's out like where it hurts from the jump and then it's like how long can you hold on for yeah, exactly. And look, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to downplay everybody's uh, physical prowess who's still playing on the show. But mm -hmm. I definitely think that you know you could, if you try and do this for fifteen minutes. Granted, it's going to be painful, but it's not that hard. I mean, like Parvati did this for like two hours. Yeah. Okay? So. Yeah, they're making it more difficult. Um, but I also think that the level of athleticism on the people that are still playing is maybe not, not as there. maybe not as like challenging as 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 some would think. Okay. Elena has a question for you. She feels very confident about your answer. She says, Be honest, Ozzy. If you were offered the chance to live on Redemption Island forever and have all of the fish and coconuts you could ever want and never again have to set foot in civilized society would you take it well there's a i'd have to say and she says i bet my entire irs payment the answer is one thousand percent yes well there's there's a couple caveats okay? yes so where's the tequila can i have yeah can i have a surfboard a surfboard yes tequila yes and and a lady <laughs> visitors yes yes yeah. then, then yes okay 100 percent. 100 percent. okay that could be the reality show this could be the new love island yeah i'm still thinking of okay once all of the the you know travel bans and borders start opening back up again yes. i'm still considering you know what maybe i'm just about to like leave it all behind and go live on a deserted island and i'll send you guys videos every once in a while mm -hmm. just like that time that you went off to rarotonga wherever the hell you went uh yeah. just gonna show up somewhere yeah exactly you exactly. and cowboy and flicka and just take over oh man that would be amazing <laughs> okay uh and then okay brian wants to know about uh ask ozzy about his book club idea oh. and his favorite books I, I i was like what is this about and then i looked this up on twitter and you said that you are a big fan of sci-fi books yes. you want to start a book club with people yeah exactly um so i put that i i put that idea out there because i'm looking for my next book um i've obviously been reading a lot during yeah. the last few weeks and so I'm just trying to figure out what book that could potentially be. Um, you know, I've read, 
I read almost strictly science fiction. You know, I obviously I, I mean, Game of Thrones. I read all the Game of Thrones. There's a couple other like fantasy books yeah. that I like a lot. I like historical fiction. Yeah. But science fiction is like my go-to. Um, and I think it'd be a really cool opportunity to be, you know, have something where it'd be a great way to interact with fans, mm -hmm. not necessarily only in the survivor space, but outside of that in, you know, in something like talking about yeah. cool science fiction books with, with far reaching ideas. I think yeah. that'd be really fun. This so, is wild that I had no idea. I, I did not uh, see you as a sci-fi guy. Yeah. Yeah. Sci-fi guy all the way. Yeah. Okay, any recommendations? Let's see. So um, there's a really cool, um, oh man, was it Neil Stevenson? I think he wrote this. It's called Seven Eves. Yeah, um, Seven Eves. Seven yeah. Eves. That was, uh, that was a really awesome book I read uh, a couple of years ago. It's kind of like a, kind of a, about a post-apocalyptic, human oh so it's timely evolution. yeah yeah uh, that's a really that's a great book it's like a thousand pages so mm -hmm. a lot of fun everything by michael crichton I mean, yeah he was, a, he was an amazing author um robert heinlein he wrote stranger in a strange land that yeah was used to be one of my favorite books um let's see there's uh oh god one of my favorite books in the last couple of years is a book called The Dog Stars. And that's also like a post-apocalyptic. It's almost like The Road, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Yeah. But a little more optimistic. Okay. So that's, if I have to recommend one book to people that I've already read that, you know, it's great, would be The Dog Stars. Dog I can't Stars. Remember the name of the, yeah, I can't remember the name of the, the author, but really, really awesome book. Okay. Uh, Ozzy, um, I saw that you did a big, uh, clothing drive recently. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, uh, what inspired you to get involved with that? So a buddy of mine has been doing a bunch of work on the Pine Ridge reservation in, uh, in the Dakotas. Yeah. And they look, I mean, I think very simply, the first nations people of uh, the United States, as well as indigenous people around the world yeah. need our help and they need to be respected for the, the amount of pain and suffering that they've been through as colonialism has, you know, left its mark. So mm. the Pine Ridge reservation has one of the highest suicide rates in um, the country. Um, they have been getting the short end of the stick for, hundreds and hundreds of years so doing anything to help out is i think it's it's something that i i see as a duty and, and whatever whatever i can do to help is something I'm, I'm trying to do so my buddy has started this uh nonprofit called sage to saddle yeah and it's to build um horse basically horse riding arenas horse facilities so that when the incredibly long cold winters come along that the children of the um of 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 the pine ridge reservation have a place that they can go and they can you know be in a in, in an environment where they can learn horsemanship um as well as be away from some of the negative influences that might contribute to whatever drugs and alcohol or bad family life um, that mm -hmm. contribute to you know, this incredibly high suicide rate. So I'm interested in helping out First Nations, yeah. um, the indigenous people of, of um, any, any given nation, um, specifically in the United States, where we, uh, I think we owe it to those people to uh, help out in any way we can. I also saw, Ozzy, that uh, I saw you are on the Cameo, uh, yeah. and I saw that you have over 100 ratings uh, on Cameo. I feel like that you must be prolific on Cameo. You know, it has been a godsend. Yeah. Uh, Cameo is a really amazing platform for me to get to interact with people as well. Yeah. I think that anything from, you know, wishing your 
significant other a happy birthday right. to a mother's day to just a shout out people uh ask me for advice on their uh audition videos yeah yeah but yeah it has helped me so much and uh, cameo has been a lot of fun so if you are looking for a shout out anyone find me on cameo um down to do whatever you, whatever you'd like but it's been really um it's been really great and it's kind of made me want to get back into doing some sort of entertainment mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, how's the garden, Ozzy? Oh, the garden is great. Yeah, I've been, uh, <laughs> I like to grow plants. Right now I've got, you know, I've got a lot of cactus, but I grow poppies every year. Yeah. Um, sometimes I grow cannabis because it's legal now. So yes, yes. I don't have any, I don't have any growing at the moment, although I probably should get some going, but yeah. I just, I love growing plants. That's one of the reasons why I have a, a plant on my foot. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so this is, uh, Ozzy has a, like, a root, like, growing got, from, like, his foot. Yeah, I've got roots growing up. I've got a tree, a tree of life on my leg. Yeah, is that new since in, in the last couple of years, or have you had that? No, I had that on uh, Game Changers. Yeah. Um, I got that in Thailand, I don't know, like, five or six years ago. Is that yeah. Stick and, stick and poke style. Which is the best way to get a tattoo, by the way. <laughs> okay. I'll take your word for it. Exactly. Um, Ozzy, um, this was so fun. Yeah, man. It was really great. It was awesome to be able to talk shop yeah. over this incredibly, this just wild and crazy season. And I'm really excited. I would like to know, I don't, maybe you've talked about this, but I'd like to know, who do you think, who's your, like, who's your pick right now? of uh, who do you think is going to win the game? Well, right now, it just seems like that Tony has all the momentum. I, I mean, I don't know who's going to stop him at this point. I think, And I think if somebody is going to stop him, I think it's either going to be uh, Jeremy or Sarah or whoever comes back from the edge because I'm not really seeing how Ben, Nick, Denise, or Michelle are going to outflank these guys. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. And if they're going to make a move, we're talking about Michelle and Nick. And I, you know, it's, it's sad because I think that Michelle has like, she's kind of like been playing under the radar this whole time. And she mm -hmm. said time and time again, how she needs to like, you know, she needs, she feels like coming into this, uh, this season that she wants to show that she deserves to be there. And yeah. like, She's got to do something. She's got to yeah. do something. She's got to know that she doesn't have a shot unless she starts to make some big moves. So. Do you agree with what Tony has said uh, earlier in the season? He talked a lot about lions and hyenas of like, uh, in this game, we got the lions, we got the, 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 the big targets, and then the hyenas are the small targets in the game. Uh, and he said, you know, it's not about like how good of a player you are, but how big, how big is the target on your back coming into a returning player season as somebody who would be a lion in a returning player season? Do you, is that a real thing? I think so for sure. Yeah. And I, and I see exactly what's going on with Nick, Denise and Michelle, you know, it's kind of like they are, you know, they don't have these big targets. So they're sort of able to like play under the radar. Nobody's really thinking about them yet. And that could get them to the end, but it's also going to be a big detriment to their game. So they gotta, they really gotta like step it up. Mm -hmm. And now is the time, like they can't really wait much longer. It has to, it has to come. Soon. Yeah. Final seven. Yeah. Ozzy. If people want to keep in touch with you, uh, get the book recommendations, uh, yeah. where, where should people follow you? Um, probably Instagram is where I'm most, um, I'm most, uh, uh, yeah, Instagram would probably be where I am on the most. I try to use Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. and then, you know, Cameo is like, obviously you can, you can have a direct link to me very easily, but I think that, uh, Twitter and, and Instagram are going to be the easiest places until I somehow get a website up. I know it's 2020 and I probably should have a website. Yeah, well, for what? What do you need a website for? You know, just for talking about talking about plants and surfing and, yeah. and science fiction books. Yeah, I feel like you could do all that on the social media. I don't know if you need the actual website to do it. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Uh, not until you have like something that you're selling, then, uh, then that's when you need the website. Everything else you could do with the social media. What? Selling my soul is not enough? Yeah, I guess so. You could, uh, I don't know if you have it. Like when you have your, when you write your book, have you ever uh, thought about writing uh, a book? 
I probably should. I don't know. Have you read Rob's book? Uh, I have it here. It's a quick read, Ozzy. It is. I did. It's, uh, you could, uh, I think you could probably, you know, knock it out in, uh, you know, 35 minutes, I think. Wow. Okay. Maybe I should. Maybe yeah. I should. The, the print, it, uh, you could probably read it from uh, across the room. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Boston Rob rule book for strategies for life. Hey, Ozzy, smarten up. You could learn a thing or two. Okay, buddy. That's uh, a pretty good accent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, Ozzy, uh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you spending so much time with me today. And uh, is, is there any, anything else you want to say about uh, Survivor or anything else? No, that's it. You know, I'm just, I think I got to start training, um, you know, for maybe season 50, whatever. whatever season, I, yeah, season 50. Well, let's just, you know, yeah. let's wait until they at least get a season 41 schedule to film and then oh, uh, right. figure, figure everything out from there. But I'm so glad that you decided to do this. Uh, this was so fun for me, and I hope that people got to see. I, I think that there's a, that uh, a lot of the fans think that, oh, Ozzy, he just cares about challenges, and, that, and that's it. And uh, that's, that's all that you would want to talk about. Yeah, well, it's, it's been a great opportunity, and I really thank you so much for you know, having a platform for all of us to come back and talk about it. And you know, a commu this community that you created is really special, and it's really cool. Yeah, so well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank, thank you, Ozzy, and uh, take care. All the best, okay? All right, man. Have a good one.